Okay, colleagues. So um, you heard we have uh, uh, participants coming from different countries uh, 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 in West Africa, and of course, quite a few of us are in other parts of the of the continent. Um, and the training is going on in the three languages we have, official languages we have in West Africa, in uh, our French, English, and, and Portuguese. So for us to start, we had unfinished business last week. We had a number of questions that uh, Miss Osai could not uh, respond to because of our time. So in order to you know, uh, kick us into that mood, I'm going to invite Osai, uh, as I fondly call her, you know, <laughs> Mrs. Osai Ojigo, who is the country director for Amnesty International Nigeria, uh, to take those questions in the next uh, five to 10 minutes. Osai, you wow. have the floor now. Please, I beg of you, you know. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you so much, Omola. Thank you uh, for other colleagues at Civicus at WAPTI and also for the participants on this course. So I'm going to try as much as possible to respond to some of the questions from last session. Um, and please, um, as a result of um, the limited time, there might not be opportunity for clarification. So I'm gonna to try to be as direct as possible. So there were a lot of questions that I had answered and just to just tease out some of the conversations again. Um, share reporting is something that NGOs do to the African Commission on Human and Peoples' Rights, for example, and to other UN bodies too. And why it's called a shadow reporting is because it's not an official state report. So there are examples of how you can go about this. And I did promise to, say, to share some with the WACSI team, so I would do that um, today so that they can share it with you. To the question about being not being a signatory to the African and ECOWAS court. Just to be clear, Benin has ratified the African protocol to the African Charter establishing the African court, but recently withdrew its declaration allowing individuals to access it directly. So this does not mean you can't bring cases from Benin. It's just that you have to go through a longer route, exhaust domestic remedies at home, and then um, get to the African Commission or any other African intergovernmental body which can then bring this to the African court. Since the court was established, th that process has only been used by the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. And we know for a fact that it takes about uh, an average of about four years now for cases to be concluded at the African Commission level and there's a backlog of cases. So the chances of people going through that route is going to be quite challenging. Um, I talked already on the issue of the hierarchy of power. So in terms of international law, regional decisions, is, um, um, international decisions are the same. They're all international law. So none is above the other. At the national level, there has been a lot of debate as to how to just oppose those decisions and make it binding. So there's a lot of jurisprudence around this area, but one thing is clear is that a country cannot use its laws in order to subvent, circumvent the, um, to circumvent the issue that has been raised at international law level, whether it's at the UN or at the African regional level. The penalties for states not abiding by judgments given by the regional courts or the regional system is usually in terms of peer pressure. So they could use sanctions, they could use means through which in terms of vying for certain positions within that particular body, they could say, oh, Nigeria, because you haven't yet abide, uh, bound yourself by the decisions of this court, so we're not going to allow you to submit a candidate for this position within the board. But you know that there's a lot of political maneuvering. So the greatest um, means through which we can ensure the implementation of decisions is through advocacy and through ensuring that we continue to ask our governments to implement. It can take some time, but it can be effective. So in terms of um, the issue about what NGOs can do to enforce these decisions, 
first is you need to be aware of it. You need to understand what Rex is pushing for and what stage it is at the level, country level implementation. For many countries, you have to go to the Ministry of Justice. It's even possible you can take a copy of that judgment to the, and make it to the attention of the Minister of Justice saying, look, are you aware of the decision of an ECOWAS court? There's a decision of the African court which pertains to our country, which we want you to enforce. Have media um, rallies, have conversations, discuss it, write articles about it so that as many people become aware of the decision, you can then mobilize a large group, group of people to, um, to call the government to account. And like I said last week, there have been decisions that have been implemented, but we see that it's also been timed with political exigencies in those countries. So for example, for many years, there were decisions against the Gambia. It was until when former President Jamey left before they became implemented. So as to the question one of our colleagues raised concerning the Benin Republic, we drew their, um, their um, declaration to the African court. And I've also gotten a decision at country level saying that they are not bound by the ECOWAS court. Um, I did a bit of inquiry. I've not yet gotten the official documents yet. But it's shocking to realize that this might also, that the ECOWAS court might also be in danger of being pushed back by the government. This is so because we found that many of the countries are talking to one another. And even in Ghana, surprisingly, there's also been a decision saying that they are not bound by the ECOWAS court's judgment. And it goes to something which for non-technical people might find baffling. If a country has signed a treaty at international law level, it should be binding automatically. Well, guess what? Many of our countries operate what we call a dualist system of law. That means um, when an international treaty has been signed, you need to now come to your country and pass it as an act of parliament, or you enact a law to give effect to it. And you find that this is common in common law countries than um, Francophone countries, but even in the case of Benin, apparently it's something that their law requires. So if we are, we're not in a situation now where governments are pushing back, so how do we as civil society review our strategies to see how we can combat these pushbacks at the regional level? They are seeing that the regional courts are more independent, they're able to give very useful um, decisions and so our governments are looking for ways in order to hamper that. So this is an area that I think we need to fight uh, a lot more. And I'll end with one point before Malara kicks me out of the screen, which is that, yes, state reporting is one way that governments are using in order to showcase what they are doing in their home countries. It's also a way through which CSOs, when you look at the recommendations from the state reporting body, to say, oh, but Nigeria, you agreed you are going to do this. Um, Cote d'Ivoire, you said you are going to implement this policy or that this law is in place. Can you give it to us? State reports gives us an easier, soft way, persuasive way through which we can get access to our government because that's something that's a process they themselves are voluntarily admitted to participate in. And so we should use it a lot more. So that issue of they are writing so many state reports, like I said last week, there's a conversation with the African Union at the level of the Department of Political Affairs and also the Office of the Legal Counsel to harmonize all the various reporting mechanisms that African countries do, such that if you've reported to the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, you can modify it and also take extracts from that to report to the African Committee on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, and even to the UN agencies, because the same country and it's the same implementation. You only need to match it to the appropriate section of the international treaty concerned. So on that note, I will say thank you very much and for the opportunity to share. Uh, we can't hear you, Malara. Okay, uh, I hope it's fine now.
Yes, it's I said left to me. I wish I can give you the floor, you know, have the whole day because I'm really, really interested in what you're saying and uh, particularly the way it connects with the issues we'll deal with on a daily basis. So uh, don't worry, we'll have more time, but not today. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Osai. Uh, colleagues, um, like Shamrid mentioned, please, if you have any follow on questions, or something, a comment you would like to make, can you please drop it in the comment section? And please, let's mute our mics uh, permanently and we can off our cameras so that we can minimize the, uh, uh, I think, uh, itches um, as we go on. So thanks for that, Osai. Once again, let me invite Lisa Lisa Majunda to really kick us into today's uh, conversation. Last week, like I mentioned earlier, we discussed in detail uh, uh, Paul. Paul introduced us to the United Nations human rights systems. Uh, uh, we went through a number of, of the uh, systems we have within the United Nations when human rights are concerned. And Osai, Osai took us through an introduction to African human rights system, kind of, you know, brought us closer home. Uh, we learned about the African human rights system, the different mechanism that we have, the legal framework and process or processes uh, through which civil society can engage. So today I'm going to invite Lisa to kind of um, tell us how uh, civil society can engage with the United Nations mechanisms. How can we engage with the Universal Periodic Review, Human Rights Council, special procedures or special rapporteur, the different treaty body mechanisms, and so on. So Lisa, um, you have the floor now. I will uh, implore that we keep the presentation as uh, you know short as possible so that we can create uh, uh, sufficient time to, to engage, which is really where uh, we can have the opportunity to deepen our exchanges with participants. So Lisa, you have the floor now. Great, thanks so much, Amalara. And um, as you said, since the sideboard is all uh, kind of back to Africa, I'm going to take you all back again to, uh, to Geneva, where I am at the moment, and talk a little bit about how civil society can work um, at the UN here. And I think I have slides if they're going up. I can't see them. Okay. So my role here in Geneva with Civicus is largely following the UN human rights mechanisms as they make their decisions, as they go through their processes, and communicating this back to, back to Civicus's members. And more importantly, kind of bringing information from Civicus members to input into the mechanisms themselves. Um, metaphorically at the moment, seeing as no one can actually come to Geneva, but hopefully that will change in the near future. So we discussed last week broadly the UN human rights system as a whole. So if you look a bit more at the practicalities, so who is who and who is responsible for, for what? And here on your screen is a couple of the bodies that we work with mainly here. So we have the OHCHR, which many of you will be familiar with, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and that's the leading UN human rights entity. And this supports states and other entities like civil society, like other UN agencies in promoting and protecting human rights. And they work through national offices in some countries, regional offices, and they have their headquarters here in Geneva. And then there's the Human Rights Council, which is an intergovernmental body of 47 member states. And they have their council sessions three times a year, occasionally more. They have a number of mechanisms. The EPR mechanism is probably the, the kind of biggest and the best. And they have special procedures, which you booked part of it last week as well. And then thirdly, we have the treaty bodies. And these are bodies made up of independent experts who who monitor and track implementation of, of human rights treaties by states. And so moving a bit more specifically onto the Human Rights Council. Can we go to the next slide? Cool. So yeah, an intergovernmental body within the UN made up of 47 states. And this discusses thematic and country human rights uh, situations throughout, throughout the year. It's got these number of mechanisms. 
It also adopts resolutions of these develop human rights policy or they mandate new mechanisms. And so where do we come into this? Civil society has such an important role in the, in the UN system, um, in the UN human rights system in particular. The UN Human Rights Council and the OHCHR really need us and they really need you and they need um, people on the ground. Civil society provides information, it contributes to the implementation of resolutions and international goals like the SDGs. Um, so bad or incomplete information makes bad and ineffective policy. And civil society is a conduit of information to the council. It brings it legitimacy, it monitors implementation, it, it does implementation. And everyone's voices are important to this, no matter kind of what field you are in, whether you're a kind of advocacy NGO, whether you're a service provision NGO, that like the system needs needs everyone to work. So it's not what you can do for the UN, but what the UN can do for you. Actually, it, it kind of works both ways. We, we all need each other. And so the role of the UN is to develop these strong resolutions, which reflect our concerns. They protect human rights defenders. They link together development, human rights and, and peace. They develop these sustainable development goals, which all the countries are supposed to be working towards. And through its intergovernmental um, system, there's a lot of scope for bilateral advocacy between states, which kind of does all the above, but it also kind of um, encourages states to protect human rights a bit better. And what we need is strong resolutions which reflect our concerns and that we can then use in national level advocacy. The special procedures of the Council support and protect civil society and human rights defenders against attacks. And as I was saying before, the kind of naming and shaming aspect of, um, of bilateral advocacy is just it has a real deterrent um, effect, which is something that we try and promote a lot of here. And so what civil society can do that's a very, very wide question, and there are very different levels of engagement. And unfortunately, despite promises to the contrary, there's still multiple barriers of entry for participation. Um, but all civil society can and should work with the UN. That's really important. And we can lobby embassies in capital, we can do advocacy trips, we can draft briefings. And all civil society can engage with the OHCHR as well. Um, only NGOs with ECOSOC accreditation can engage formally with the UN through delivering statements and holding side events and accrediting partner NGOs, which we do a lot of here. Um, so at the Human Rights Council, civil society has an observer role. So we can attend sessions, we can speak in debates, we can attend consultations on resolutions, and we can credit our partners. So as we mentioned earlier, the, the HRC is responsible for adopting resolutions and for discussing human rights situations. So what do we want from it? We want strong resolutions and we want an uh, opportunity to really publicly raise our concerns or to maybe try and shift the conversation in the direction that we want them to be. And to look a bit more closely at resolutions, so these can be on thematic issues like freedom of association, the right to food, kind of thing really and some established independent mechanisms, often country specific. So this session we just had, they established a fact-finding mission on Libya, which was a long time coming. It's something that a lot of NGOs have been pushing for. At the 44th session, which is the one coming up next week, we'll be working on a resolution on peaceful protests, and there's a few other thematic, um, thematic resolutions that are coming up. And what civil society can do is draft suggested language. We can attend and speak at informal consultations in which they kind of develop these resolutions. And we can speak in debates. And there are two main forms of debate at the council. Uh, a general debate, kind of one per council item, and an interactive dialogue, which will be with the High Commissioner or with various special rapporteurs. Um, so we also want concerns to be raised about countries that aren't necessarily on the agenda. So, for example, last session, India was a very high priority for us, but there isn't a resolution on India and there's nothing really happening. But we wanted the High Commissioner for Human Rights to raise it publicly in her report, which she did, which was great. And we wanted states as well to raise these concerns kind of publicly and privately, which they also did. And side events at the Council are also a very, very good way to kind of pave the way for these new issues to be discussed 
and for our positions and states positions to be sort of set out in more detail so you know exactly who you need to advocate to and the starting point at which everyone is coming from. And generally these side events will be targeted at states, um, diplomats and civil society audiences. Mm. Oh, I think that's a couple of slides back. There was this, back um, on Yeah. So this is just the program of work for this next session. And you can see there all the kind of, all the debates that will be set out. And this is a sort of snapshot of what the council will, will work on in a given, in a given time frame. And then the slide after that is a list of resolutions that were adopted uh, a couple of sessions ago, some of the resolutions. And you can see there, there's a mix of country specific resolutions and thematic resolutions. Generally, the country specific one kind of mandates something to be done. And the thematic ones um, mandate more something to be kind of monitored and for states to, to uphold. And the UPR, which is the Human Rights Council's absolutely flagship uh, human rights mechanism. So through the UPR, every state is examined every four or five years. And so essentially how it works is that states are examined through three documents, a national report, which is prepared by the state under review, um, a report of information from UN bodies, which is collected by OHCHR, and information from other stakeholders, NGOs, NHRIs. And this is where the shadow reports that I was talking about before come in as well. And so developing a shadow report and submitting it to the UPR is a really, really crucial um, part of human rights advocacy and advocacy to do with anything really, whatever your, whatever your focus is. The UPR covers all the human rights. Um, our end goal at the end of the UPR is to have very strong recommendations, which we can take back to the state under review and track how they're implementing them. And so it's really useful in this situation to form coalitions with other national or international organizations working on a similar issue. That way you can coordinate messaging and make it even stronger and develop even stronger, more specific recommendations. So the recommendations are developed by other states. So this is when you go to your embassies in capital and say, hey, here's our submission. We're very interested in this. We would love to see a recommendation on, on this. And again, like partnership is, is really key in this. And because this is all a wee bit abstract, if you look at a, a case study, so say, and this is true in so many countries, unfortunately, but if you take a human rights defender or journalist who's been repeatedly arrested, threatened for reporting, like what can you do um, with the Human Rights Council? How can the Human Rights Council kind of protect and, and help? And a couple of key ways is to raise a very, a very specific case in uh, debates. I think just having a, that public name out there at this platform is really helpful and adds a layer of protection. You can talk to the OHCHR, the country office, the regional office, their team here, with their appraisals team, who's kind of based half here in half New York. And that also adds an extra layer of protection. You can submit a communication to special rapporteurs. Um, there's a few that would be relevant here, for, you know, expression, opportunity detention, special rapporteur on women. Um, and what they can do is make a statement. They can write to your government to kind of tell them to stop, follow up on the case, and just again, add this extra layer of um, publicity that's really helpful. You can discuss with the country delegation here in Geneva, and at the Human Rights Council itself, kind of speak at a side event, just to sort of broadcast it to the world, what's happening. And this situation would be particularly important because obviously we all know a, a free press is, is crucial for a country to be sort of open and for NGOs to be able to do their work. And then to look again at another situation, say a factory is destroying local biodiversity, how could the UN help with that? And you could maybe develop a submission to the UPR that kind of sets this out in some detail and gives very specific recommendations on how to, how to kind of stop it and sort it. And a really interesting way of doing that is to look at human rights resolutions from the past on the environment and to use that very specific language to develop these specific recommendations. So you can say, look, this state, Benin, Sierra Leone, whatever, has signed up to this resolution. They are not upholding this. Um, they're going against their obligations. Here, here we have set it out, and this is what they need to do. And I think the more specific you can get it, the better. Again, send a commu communication to the Special Rapporteur on the environment. 
asking them to communicate with your government. You can look going back to the UPR again, you can look at states in the last UPR who made environmentally focused recommendations and you can talk to their embassies in capital and say, you're interested in this topic. Uh, this is something our government's doing. How can, how can you try and get them to stop? And again, as well, with the specific cases, you can raise them here at the Human Rights Council through all the ways we looked at before. And during the course of the UPR cycle, like, there's a few opportunities to, um, to, to jump in and raise specific cases. I think there's a midterm review that comes up sort of halfway through every country's UPR. It's okay, another really good opportunity to, um, to do a shadow report. And I think that's pretty much all from me on this. I'm sorry we just absolutely rattled through that, but very here and very available for questions. So please let me know. Thank you so much, Lisa. I mean, that's a lot of information within that short time, a whole lot. Like, this is something we should be discussing for a very long time. But, I know, I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's <laughs> fine. Uh, again, colleagues, uh, for comments, questions, for Lisa or, or on anything, please remember to drop it on the chat uh, in the chat uh, box. Somebody's monitoring that and is capturing the questions. So before uh, we move on, we actually ought to have taken a short poll before Lisa's presentation. I now know that you have answers to question number one, but let's see what happens with the rest. So um, uh, Shamrin, if you have the poll now, can we go live with the poll? Participants, you are to answer the questions that are shown on your screen uh, now. Uh, Shamrit, can we have the poll? Okay. So can we all That's vote now? Can we vote now? So we have like four questions. Uh, I think we are unable to click. Uh, we should be able to click and we're not writing it some way. Do we have the right poll on? Okay, I find it difficult to click. Is it the same with others? Hello, Lara, it's because you're a co-host. I'm sure participants are able to... to ah, okay, so I can't vote. That's fine. <laughs> All right. Okay. So the first question says, which of the following hum uh, UN human rights mechanisms have you engaged in the past? And... Um, so far, uh, the Human Rights Council seems to be leading this poll. And the second one says, is there a difference between advocacy and lobbying? And uh, everybody is saying yes. Wow, interesting. And the third one says, confrontation is the best form of advocacy strategy. Uh, seventy-one percent says no, and twenty-nine says yes. So we're still voting. Keep it coming. And the last question says, "How many advocacy strategies do you know? Uh, do you know of?" So um, about thirty-eight percent are saying one or two. Um, Fifty-six is saying they know three or four, and twenty-two percent are aware of uh, five and above. So let's give it one more minute. We have only eleven people who have voted. So can we all vote now, please? Especially participants. Can we vote now? We we'll leave it on for another one, one and a half minutes. Let's see. Okay, I think we are all very clear on question two, and this is interesting. Everybody's saying yes, there's a difference between advocacy and lobbying. Okay, 
Okay. Keep it coming. At least we should get more than uh, 20 people voting. Okay, about 40% of us has voted now. We have 35 participants in the room at the moment. Okay, it's coming. Let's keep it coming. We're going to stop voting in another one minute. So please, can we all vote now? If you're having any challenges voting, kindly drop the comments in the box in the chat section. So somebody said he's not seeing the poll. What are they supposed to do? Shamrit, can you write, can you respond to them in the chat box? All right, Larry, we're working on it. Yes. Okay, because it should just, it should appear automatically on your screen. It should appear. That may come with some special uh, requirements. I'm not so sure. Okay, 10 more seconds to go. If you haven't voted, the time to vote is now. The time to vote is now. Okay. So I think I'm just going to make do with what we have at the moment. So the first question says, which of the following UN human rights mechanism have you engaged in the past? And 63% uh, says that they have engaged the Human Rights Council. I think it happens to be the most popular. The Human Rights Council, 31% have engaged the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and 25% have engaged human rights treaty bodies in the past. I see the poll is still moving. And the second question, which really gladdens my heart, it says, is there a difference between advocacy and lobbying? And everybody says yes. And truly, the answer is yes. Lobbying is just one of the tactics in advocacy. Uh, we have seen instances where uh, people take lobbying to be advocacy in itself. Lobbying is in advocacy, you know. And um, uh, so thank you. Everybody got that. I'm, and I'm excited. And the third question says, confrontation is the best form of advocacy strategy. Um, so we have 39% uh, saying yes, confrontation it is, it is the best. And 61% saying no, I think uh, there are other strategies that should be used. So uh, speaking as an advocate, so uh, advocacy strategist, uh, confrontation is a good strategy. I mean, we all use it most of the time or sometime, but what we say is you do not engage in confrontation except and until you have usurped all other forms of strategies. So confrontation should be your last type of strategy to adopt. It should be the really last. And you should have documented evidences that shows that you have used all other forms of advocacy strategy and be able to prove to the authorities that it failed before you embark on confrontation. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that uh, we have quite a number of um, people who disagree that confrontation is the best form of advocacy strategy. Um, the final question says, how many advocacy strategies do you know or you have used in the past? 44% says, yes, they've used one or two or they know one or two. Uh, 37 says three or four. And we have 32 who have used five or more, aware of five or more. I think this is interesting. It's interesting feedback. And it gives us a kind of idea of uh, the, uh, the knowledge level in the room. So thank you, participants, for participating in this poll. Can we take the polls down now? Can we take it down now? Can we take it down? 
I can still see it. Okay, maybe I'm just to close my own screen. All right. Okay, thank you guys. Um, thank you for participating in that. So now we want to scratch the surface of advocacy as civil society. I think the more uh, knowledge and, 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 and information we have on advocacy helps us to know when to advocate, to whom we are advocating, and how to advocate. So whilst the human rights, international and regional human rights system is the context of our conversation, let's have a brief exchange on what advocacy is all about and why civil society should be uh, uh, interested and should participate in advocacy. So Shamri, if you have the slides, uh, um, we, can, we can roll the slides now. So the idea is to all participants, I'm just going to run through the slides very quickly. Remember to note your questions and, and comment in the chat box. So when it's time to open the floor, we are going to start with the comments in the chat box first. So please note your comments, your questions, either for Lisa or for the, the, the presentation I'm coming to make now, kindly note it in the chat box. Somebody is uh, monitoring that to take the questions. So um, we'll be looking at advocacy and uh, uh, what it's all about. Uh, we look at advocacy strategies that we can use for engagement. Uh, we're going to look at uh, how we are going to develop, how to develop inclusive and companion communication plans, uh, because advocacy has a lot to do with communication. It's important. If you're not communicating, nobody's listening to you. You're not saying anything. You're not engaging, basically. Okay? And then we're going to be looking at networking and lobbying. I'm really excited that uh, we are I've noted that lobbying is not uh, uh, the only form, uh, it's only a form of uh, advocacy strategy. It's not the end in itself. And then we'll take some time to look at the role of civil society in advocating for human rights uh, protections across the continent or across the different countries in which, in which we work. So advocacy by definition is really a set of actions that we take a civil society or a citizen that is directed at changing uh, policies, changing, uh, uh, you know, engaging policymakers or commenting on position or programs of, of, of government using various strategies and tactics. So when we are talking about advocacy, we are not talking about an event, a single action that you are going to take to either promote or raise issues of human rights violations in your country or the context in which we work. We are talking about a set of different actions that you have to take. And by the time we get to the point around strategies, you will, you will get to understand why advocacy is really about sets of actions, different activities. It is not something that you do one off. Okay, so advocacy is something that you have to be deliberate about and you have to plan, okay, as, 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 as an advocate or as a civil society, as civil society actors. And some of the questions you want to ask yourself is, when we're talking about human rights, this is a knowledge that is universal and then you expect your government, you expect your power holders, you expect the different institutions that we have learned about uh, via OSI to be aware of what, of, of what they're supposed to do when, where human rights is concerned, the right to life, uh, freedom of expression, uh, right to association, and all of that. It's, it's an open knowledge. So why should, do we have to advocate for it? We have to advocate for a number of reasons. You have to advocate to pursue your intention. Your intention is different from that of another person. So this is one of the reasons why advocacy, ad ad advocacy comes to play. It doesn't occur in a vacuum. It, you have to be deliberate about it. You must have a goal that you're trying to push. And the goal I'm trying to push as a climate change advocate is different from that of a child rights advocate. This is why your advocacy has to be intentional. It has to be deliberate. Uh, you're trying to call attention to a particular issue, a particular human rights issue. Is it right to expression or right to information or right to protection of lives or media freedom or whatever it is that you're working on? But 
it must be targeted at an issue. And the goal of your advocacy is to influence. You want to influence the policy making. I, I, I love the way uh, Alisa put it in our implementation. There are a number of treaties that our various governments have subscribed to as an acceded to design it. And of course, uh, it's difficult sometimes when they come back home to see them really living up to these different uh, treaties. Uh, uh, and like Osai put it, there are some, depending on your law system or your legal framework in your country, some of these things will have to be domesticated before they can take effect. So how would you, as a civil society in your country, who is aware that your government has signed on to CEDA, for example, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of uh, uh, um, uh, what is it, um, violence against women. How do you ensure that your country, your government lives up to what they have signed on to at the international arena? So at your local level, you need to advocate, okay? You use advocacy to promote issues of the oppressed. I mean, we do this all the time. So you're talking about the marginalized, you're talking about the, the, the IDPs, internally displaced person, you're talking about the rights of children, the rights of women, and so on. And the rights of, of, of uh, bisexuals, uh, LGBTI community, and all of that. You use advocacy for social justice. And most importantly, you use advocacy to inform and educate. Sometimes you think the knowledge is there because we are talking about human rights and it's universal anyways. But no, it's not all the time that you think what you know, others are aware of it. So advocacy is a good strategy, a good, a good means of educating, of informing not only your government about what their rights should, uh, uh, what their rights, what their responsibilities are, but also to educate the citizens on what to hold government accountable to. Okay, and then you want to ask yourself what are the key elements that we should look at when you want to advocate uh, 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 within this human rights uh, parameters. Uh, advocacy generally, there are a number of key elements that we have to look at. It is really talking about change. If your advocacy is not targeted at change, then you're not advocating. Perhaps you're just having a rendezvous, okay? And you advocate to people who can make the change. You advocate to people who can make the change and you have to, delib you have to be deliberate about it. Advocacy is a deliberate action. You have to, if you don't stumble on advocacy, you don't, you don't, it's not by chance. I, I chanced on it and then I took it. No, you deliberate, you're intentional and then you plan it and then you execute it. And the execution must lead to the desired change. This is important for us, either as human rights advocates or any kind of or civil society generally, for every sector in which we work, what we desire is a certain kind of change. And advocacy has proven to be a big way in which we can we can we can make those those changes in our respective communities. Uh, it's about building support, uh, 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 like we say in my in on the street of Lagos, the more the merrier. So advocacy is a game of number. The more we are, the better it is. Okay. So this is this is this is this is important. So when we get to networking, you're going to um, understand this better. And um, Really, advocacy is about analysis. If you are unable to conduct a thorough analysis of the human rights issues you're working on or the human rights environment that, that, uh, uh, that we have, then it's, uh, um, the screen is off, uh, Chamrit. Okay, so if you're unable to do analysis of the issue, the human rights issue that you are trying to advocate, if you don't understand the context, if you don't understand the human rights environment, then it's going to be difficult for your advocacy to lead to change. Uh, you can move to the next slide, please. I'm already on that. Next. Okay. So the secret of your advocacy as, as an advocate or as a human rights uh, you know, person, it's your ability to do analysis. You have to be able to analyze the issues you have, the different violations you're seeing. You are able to, you know, to just oppose against the different uh, regulations or international instruments, treaties, uh, 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 and so on that you have. And your willingness to repeat what you know over and over and over. So don't be surprised when they say, you know, advocates, they talk too much. 
I get that all the time, but it's okay, okay? So, and uh, it's, it's, about, it, it, it's about your ability to be able to provide an argument an argument to support whatever analysis that you have done. Advocacy is really telling you about getting your facts, getting your data, providing your evidences. I remember Osai said it last week that you must have that passion to document. Don't, don't rely on your brain or your, your, you know, your intel, intellectual competency alone. You must be, able, as an advocate, be you a human rights advocate or whatever advocate at all, civil society, we cannot do without evidences. So you must have that inclination to always document, to always get it. And these days with your phone, I mean, we can do everything. It's one of the best things that's happened to us. You can do a lot of documentation with your phone. Evidences, it's, what, it's the backbone of every good and successful advocacy because they're going to ask you, how can you uh, 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 show us or prove to us that so and so a laws or rights has been violated? You need to provide evidences because where you are, maybe uh, uh, you are the only one seeing what is going on, okay? I already talked about the need for you to understand having adequate, adequate information, adequate knowledge of the environment. This time, your local, your local, uh, your country is important because this is where you probably want to advocate for certain rights or certain uh, uh, instruments to be implemented, holding your government accountable. But it's also important for you to have that knowledge of the global environment, and that is why when Paul and Lisa and and Osai were sharing with us the different instrument that we have, it's very important because it is this that we are going to hold on to when it's time for us to engage. And finally, um, for advocacy, you have to be original, accurate, and you have integrity. Now, I talked earlier about the need for communication. This, 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 this is it's absolutely important. You have to be strategic in your communication. Now, when it's time for you, I remember also, uh, I guess one of the earlier presenter talked about you know, you knowing the, what your government is presenting uh, 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 at, at the global level, and it's something that we are very familiar with as civil society. We always provide alternative reporting. We call it shadow reporting. You know, to sometimes when they are lucky, it aligns with govern with what government is presenting, and most times it's it's completely different. I have been at um, uh, 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 international level where. Uh, civil society and government just presented completely different uh, recommendations for the same country. And the question is, who is right? But we know that, um, you know, uh, 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 based on, on, on sci science and data, civil society are always telling, you know, more truth than most of our government. So when we're talking about strategic communication in advocacy, your ability to inform is at the crux. What you have seen, what you have documented, the violations that you have noted, the things that is happening contrary to global standard, you have to be able to document it and then inform. Who are you informing? You are informing yourself. You are informing your colleagues. When we talked about networking, coalition, you know, like minds organization and individual that are working on similar issues with you. You are informing them. And you're not just informing for informing sake. It's to catalyze something. So you want to persuade them to move to action. If you are not doing this in your advocacy, if you are not using your data, if you are not using your facts to do these three things, to inform, to persuade, and move to action, then you are not, you, you are not aiming at any change. Uh, 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 that simply means you are not advocating for nothing. Okay, so this is very important. Let's move very quickly. Um, so I, I love the fact that we already talked about strategy. I think I'm not going to I'm not going to belabor that. So there are two, five. Um, you can move to the next one. Uh, they're basically uh, we have been able to categorize uh, advocacy strategies into five family, if you like. Uh, uh, most time we want to collaborate, which is what we encourage civil society to do. Uh, in collaboration, we have opportunity to present our facts and evidences to decision makers. And yeah, increasingly, as we deepen democracy in the region across our countries, most of this, most of them are listening. 
either whether they do something after they have listened is a different ball game entirely but of course they will always tell you you know we're engaging civil society so at this opportunity to engage we are trying to cooperate to collaborate whilst to driving on our desire okay and then we also uh, 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 there's a lot around uh, educational strategy this is where you do your research you do your mapping you educate the populace you educate the, your colleagues you educate I mean you put the information out there you analyze the data you present your evidences all that you're doing with all these activities is what we call educational uh, uh, strategies you're trying you, it's like you're building uh, 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 the, the, the foundation for your advocacy. So it's a strategy that we do. We do a lot of persuasion as well, under which we have lobbying. So like I said earlier, lobbying is just one form of advocacy tactics which as you can see here and uh, i think with a lot of human rights i'm not a human rights um um expert like my colleagues but i know when it comes to human rights we use a lot of litigation and when you if you reflect on the size presentation you can see a lot of that and i've, I've uh, i'm sure uh like um, the Benin situation, the Gambia situation, most of these cases made it to the ECOWAS court. A lot of violations of the rights of media, media uh, activists and media personnel, most of these cases, they make it to, uh, to the um, ECOWAS court, you see? So litigation is, is a viable strategy that we can use to advocate, especially when you're dealing with powers. By powers, I mean government and um, yeah, government and their institution. Now, I purposely put this confrontation to be the last because really it should be the last strategy you ever take. So before you use confrontation strategy, you, you must have documented, you must have documented proof that the other four categories have been used and failed. This, this, this is what we advise. Let's move on very quickly. So uh, networking is very key, especially when we are talking about the issue of women rights in the sense that this is supposed to be a global, um, widely known issues. So in that, for that, for that singular uh, uh, fact, you cannot push for it alone. You cannot make the demands alone. And I do tell people in each of my section, if you are the only one, yes, there's nothing bad in you being the one starting an advocacy agenda. Somebody will always note the anomaly in the society. Somebody will always notice a social ill social problem somewhere. We may not notice it together, but bringing it to the attention of the next person is the beginning of your networking, okay? So if you start off an advocacy agenda or issue, and you see that you are the only one talking about it, then you are not doing something right, okay? This is why we talk about the need for you to build a broad base for your issue. You can't be the only one who have a problem with the issue. So if you remain the only one after a while, then it means you're not educating, you're not informing, you're not doing a lot of analysis, you're not convincing, you're not persuading. You know, we talked about the need to inform, persuade, and move to action. That's how uh, 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 strategic you can communicate in advocacy. So networks is important. Networks consist of uh, uh, people who share similar views with you on a certain human rights issues or certain issue, whatever it is, be it climate change, be it ch children's rights, uh, uh, women uh, equality, gender equality, whatever it is. And most of these things that we are talking about have their places within the whole gamut of human rights conversation. Okay, and so you, you, it's where you share your ideas, it's where you leverage on strength, it's where you, you strengthen, you know, the base for the conversation. It is actually very critical to, to success of any advocacy. Most of the advocacy that we have seen in the past, uh, 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 and uh, I will be sharing some of the links where you can watch a number of documentaries on advocacy, it has a lot to do with people connecting together. Like I said, it is a game of the more the merrier. You need to get people on board. It's difficult to work together, but I tell you, when we are able to do, there is nothing we cannot put down. 
yeah, we, we cannot pull down. That's 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 true. It gives you opportunity to leverage on power, to expand your capacity and all of that. So you may want to ask yourself, you have a very big organization, human rights organization in the Gambia or in Liberia or in Cape Verde. Why do you need to network? I tell you, no matter how loud you speak in your room or in your office, you cannot speak louder than your voice. It is the networks of people that you have put together that will help you to replicate or amplify, amplify what you're saying. So it's, uh, it gives you opportunity for louder voice, uh, uh, you know, uh, higher profiling, visibility, wider audience, professional development, because uh, you may be an organization who is, you know, pretty much new in advocacy um, or human rights issues, and you have another organization who has been in the business for 20 years. It's an opportunity to leverage on their experiences and so on, okay? It's improved efficiencies and uh, credibility and integrity. When you are the only one talking about it. Uh, uh, your credibility and integrity may be put to question. But if you have diverse kind of people talking about these violations, it gives us, uh, you know, higher credibility and, 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 and integrity. And when we talk about the issue of solidarity, especially uh, uh, building solidarity across our national boundaries, it all lies on this kind of networking, you know, uh, uh, and so on. Um, so um, very quickly, let's move to lobbying. Like I said, lobbying, all lobbying is advocacy, but not all advocacy is lobbying. Uh, if you're very familiar with the West, lobbying with the West, the Western world, lobbying is a critical issue. In fact, if you have received some grants, they will make it very clear to you. Uh, 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 most, mostly from the West that you cannot use these resources to lobby. And personally, I can tell you, it's, it's, it, it, it's a little demeaning if we have to lobby for rights to be protected. Because when you understand lobbying, like I said, is a tactics of advocacy, is the process of trying to influence policymakers in favor or oppose. Now, this is where the problem is, especially when we are talking about it for human, for human rights issues. When you try to lobby people in favor or opposing an issue, you can go to any length to do that. Most of which sometimes they are not, they are unjustifiable. And uh, lobbying in this part of the world, we know, we know how, how um, rudimentary it could be. And, 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 and like also the second point says, is an attempt to influence directly or indirect, indirectly uh, agencies activity. Now, if you are influencing, following through the right channel, that's fine. I will simply put it as influencing. But the moment you jump into the lobbying space, you're trying to shift someone's ground or someone's position in your own favor. Uh, which sometimes some of the nuances of it sometimes could be unhealthy. So it's important for us, for us to know that. Uh, lobbying is not compulsory in advocacy, especially if you're talking about human rights advocacy. You don't have to lobby as such, but when you get to the higher level, like the UN and, uh, you know, like we have talked about, the lobby is essential because then it becomes a, games of, uh, a game of state to state. And here, you have to lobby people to be on your side, to favor your, your, your position and, and all of that. But when you're talking about local engagement, local advocacy, really, I think uh, you'll be going to an extreme to really want to employ, employ lobbying to speak to your policymakers or your members of parliament and all of them. So there are, there, there are different levels of that. So we are almost done. Uh, and this is very important. I want us to, to, to take a, a better look at this. So with human rights advocacy, you need to be working on a human rights issue. This is, this is important. You can't be just all over the place. You're working on an issue, a human rights issue. It could be a uh, uh, right to expression. I mean, we have all those rights. When you click on uh, the link, the link there, I'm sure you're gonna have access to this presentation. You see all the universal declaration of human rights. You need to know the issue. What you don't know, you cannot make demands of. You need to know, you need to research the issue, decide on a course of, on a course of action. Do you want to, uh, um, engage uh, uh, simply, you know, collaboratively, or you want to adopt a different, a different strategy. 
knowing the issue, your knowledge of the issue will help you in making the right choice, you know. Uh, it's important for you to know those who do not support. I think consistently, um, we have had two school of thought around the issue of LGBTI, for example, and they make it clear. So you can easily see those who are against the rights that you are, being, you are trying to push when it comes to LGBTI community. Even when it comes to, you know, um, uh, girls rights, you know, girls education and all of that. We have different school of thought and you find most of them even within the civil society. You need to have an action plan. Um, publicize, promote, engage media. And now that media has become free for all with social media, I think uh, whatever you're doing needs to be out there. Uh, it helps you to sustain what you're talking about. It helps you to identify people who are doing similar thing in other countries that you can actually come together uh, 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 to, to, to strengthen your engagement. Uh, it's always good to evaluate and reflect on how far you've gone. And what reflection does in advocacy, it helps you to uh, evaluate uh, uh, not only your successes, but the mode, the strategies that you have used. There are times you use strategy A, when in actual fact, if you had adopted B, you may have gotten a better result. Now, what can we do as civil society? There are a lot of things we can do. You, if you are not monitoring, you don't identify the gaps. So as civil society, the first thing we have to do, you have to be a witness, you have to monitor. You have to monitor, you have to document what you're seeing, you have to, uh, uh, the, the violations, you have to categorize them uh, against uh, which, which rights is being violated. You have to call people out if they have a responsibility, be it as a, a result of what they have they have signed on to. I know most of our government have signed CEDA. Uh, I'm talking a lot about women's rights because it's also something that is pretty much interest, uh, uh, you know, of interest to me. Uh, they were all at Maputo, they were all uh, at Beijing and all of that. And then when we look within our respective countries now, Things are not changing for women's representation in, in, in power, for example. So we need to call people out. You are not doing this. You need to educate as civil society. There are times that you'll be surprised. Some citizens do not know when their rights have been violated. And this is our job as civil society. Some will tell you, and when you, when you, when you engage with uh, people working on gender-based violence, some women and men alike don't even know uh, they are going through violence. So it is your job, our job as civil society, to raise this awareness of violation, educate others about what should be based on certain treaties, certain instrument mechanisms that are there, and what responsibility each and every one of us should have. Um, I, I had an opportunity a couple of years back when we were talking about the SDGs to uh, join African team uh, to advocate for finance for development. It was in Addis. Uh, and this is when I learned about the, the strategic importance, you know, of engaging at high level. Uh, our governments uh, across the world had come into artists to talk about how the SDGs was going to be financed. And they, are, they came with prepared documents. And right there in Addis, uh, we were able to change some things. And if you look at that document today, uh, you will see some of the uh, 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 introductions which came as a result of how civil society engaged, advocated right there and then. Governments didn't plan for it, but they could not leave the room until they make those, they make those inclusions. You need to empower. It's very important. The knowledge that you know, if it's not shared with the next person, if they don't see you, nothing moves on. You are the knowledge house for everything, for the evidences and all of that. You need to disperse them, you need to share them so that it gives you a broader base for people to participate, uh, uh, for louder voice and to create change. Uh, lobby is important, like we have said, especially because we're talking about multiple countries trying to push a lot of issues at the same time. Do not, I don't want us to mistake about this. When you are in your country and you're trying to engage with your government, personally, I do not recommend that you, 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 you use lobbying. Uh, there's no point lobbying your uh, 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 policymakers. 
But when it becomes international politics and engagement on rights and all of that, yes, lobbying is an in, important tool that we use to put pressure uh, uh, on government. Um, legally enforced, and I think this is one, one of the things that uh, human rights NGOs, especially across the region, are doing you know, uh, uh, well enough, uh, bringing violations to justice and using international human rights legal argument to support cases, either uh, from re recommendations or shadow reporting, following through your state's recommendation and all of that. And finally, is fulfilling rights provide direct services that fulfill the immediate human right of leads to others. This, this, is, this is all what civil society can do. And some of this we do through social services. You know, we have organizations who are just there and they provide social services to people whose one right to, to life or whatever, rights to health have been violated over the years. So this is important. The other actions that you could do as a roundup is uh, having that skills to, to develop your message. Messaging is critical in the sense that um, the way you package the evidences that you have and whom you're, you're sharing or you're directing the evidences at has a lot to say about how successful your engagement or your advocacy would be. Now, this is where we, most of us as civil society, we mix it. We have a single message and we use a single strategy to disseminate this message to different actors. Now, that doesn't really work. I wish we have more time to really talk about messaging. It's very important. I think some of these other points I have raised, uh, for those who are, who work on human rights issue on a day-to-day -day basis. They use a lot of petition writing, you know, appeal letters, recommendations, shadow reporting. All of these are actions that we should take. Now, the last slide I have is really where I have seen uh, a number of gaps in civil society, uh, especially when we're talking about the issue of human rights. And I purposely put this last slide. Uh, if you don't know the difference between these four categories uh, of, um, how do I put it? Uh, then we have a lot of issues. When we are talking about declaration, if your government, for example, has subscribed to a certain declaration, is a document stating standard or principle, but which is not legally binding. Now you can you can engage your government, you can advocate and quote these declarations, hoping that in the spirit of togetherness, uh, <laughs> they will yield to your demand. That's one. But when we are talking about covenants, we are talking about convention, we are talking about charter and treaty, you have a right to owe them to account because this is legally binding. Now, this is specifically to some of us here who are not human rights actors or activists as it were or professionals as it were we still need to have knowledge of these differences when we talk about ratification it's a formal process by which countries agreed to be banned by the terms of the treaty now uh, 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 some of them don't just fully ratify we have partial ratification we have acceded to and all of that I'm, I'm sure osai is probably laughing at me now because this is our field so i don't want to go too much okay so you need to know what you're going and we have all this information on uh, on uh, most of the uh, un human rights sites they tell you especially with regards to specific treaty and countries they will tell you which your uh the position your government has taken uh, 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 but the the issue for me which is something we need to pay attention to is the different legal system that we have in our respective countries some countries are unable to do nothing even when they have ratified a treaty or something until it is passed into uh, um, an act of law, as we say, then an act of parliament, sorry, they are unable to do anything and that shouldn't be. But of course, they will tell you the uh, uh, domestication has to be ratified at, at the parliament or acceded to at the parliament. We need to know where we are and then we can channel an, a proper engagement you know, um, uh, strategy to 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 push for our interest i'm going to stop here like i said it's just a scratch you know of the a tip of the iceberg uh um so this is the end of my presentation they're going to sh they're going to share this with you i've seen a lot of comments and on the on the charts 
um, on the chat. And uh, if you permit me, I will want us to open the floor. Now the floor is filled with French, English, and Portuguese. So I'm going to call my colleague. I'm going to invite my colleague, um, Shamrid, who is perfectly bilingual, you know, to kind of help us with what we currently have on the chat box, and then we'll open the floor for engagement. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lara. So we can start with the first question. The first question is, what can AU and the UN do in, in, in the field of underreporting human rights abuses? What can AU and the UN do in terms of underreporting of human rights abuses? Yes. The second one, why do some leaders who are abusers of human rights seemingly get protection from the West? Okay. Another one is what protection are in place at the UN for emerging human rights advocates? Okay. The next one is passing political message through popular education and example of advocacy. Can you say that again? Is passing political messages through, pro through popular education an example of advocacy? Okay, popular message. Yes, sir. Okay. Another one is are straight protest or sittings advocacy strategies? If not, in which category can they be placed? Street protest. Yes, street protest or sitting. Okay. Sorry, okay. we can't hear advocacy anything. Strategy. Anybody can help us on that? Yes, sir. Please come again. Paul, what did you say? Hello, Paul, was that you? Um, okay, so let me continue. Muted. You are mute. Okay, you are let muted. me more call one minute. Yes, Paul. You can Paul, speak. Can you speak? Paul, you can speak. Side. Okay, so you were in the. Maybe if thing. others are if others are listening, you could continue. Where it can be sorted. But I can't hear anything. Okay, no, that's important. You need to hear something because some questions are coming to you. <laughs> so uh, can we sort that out, Paul? Yes, Paul. Maybe you have mute the original source of the audio while switching the translation. So check on your translation icon and make sure that original source of audio is not off. Um, okay. I'm happy to take a couple of the questions while Paul is, is sorting out his, um, okay. his sound. Okay, so Shamrit, can you continue? Okay, we have another one, but which is rather a comment. She said, in my case, I worked for three years as secretary of the Restricted Committee of the HIV and Disability Platform of Handicap International. Um, Yes, I think she's basically sharing her experience working in the area okay. of advocacy and lobbying. It was Let's move on to another question then. So you can take this batch first. More questions okay. are coming, but yes, we can go ahead. Okay. So Lisa, hey. I think you should take the floor. <laughs> sure, happy to. Um, that's a really interesting set of questions. So if we go from the top, I'll just take the ones that um, kind of relate more to what I was speaking about. Uh, what can the AU and the UN do in the underreporting of human rights abuses, which is connected very closely to the second question of why do some leaders who are abusers of human rights seemingly get protection for the West? And I think in a way, the second question kind of answers the, the first question. The AU and the UN are both inherently political bodies. They're intergovernmental. They're not unbiased. The state's interests there will, will come first. And I think our role in dealing with the underreporting of human rights abuses 
is just to report as NGOs. I think we have a lot of uh, responsibility and also a lot of, of power as people on the ground who kind of, who have this information, who can report. Um, we just, we need to kind of do that. And then I don't think we can, and the issue of the politicization and the unwillingness of certain states to deal with other states, that's just always going to be in play. And what we can do is just try and make the process as transparent as possible. And that's something we do at the council um, quite a lot. That's quite a big focus of our, of our advocacy. At the moment, kind of pointing out the hypocrisy of countries who won't take action on Saudi Arabia, for example, even though Saudi Arabia is awful because they're, they're <laughs> kind of too, because <laughs> they're almost too powerful to touch. And last week, there was kind of an example of this in action where the African group of countries proposed a resolution on the US, which the US then kind of bullied everyone into making a lot weaker um, mm -hmm. to everyone's uh, disappointment. And that was an example as well of the African group really coming together and proposing a very, very good, strong resolution which showed kind of a lot of power. And we would like to kind of point this out in future to countries in the African group who continue to persist in violating human rights and say, look, you drafted this incredible resolution, you supported it, we supported you. Now, you know, kind of practice what you preach a bit better. And so you need to just kind of uh, link up that advocacy circle in a way. But yeah, like I said, it's such a political body, that's, that's always going to be a problem. Um, what protection are in place for the UN for emerging human rights advocates? So the UN has a team that deals with reprisals, which are attacks against people for uh, dealing specifically with the UN. They have a team here in Geneva who are, who are good. And the UN also work through their regional and country offices. And um, it depends on what kind of protection you mean. So if it's a human rights advocate who's being kind of threatened, attacked, imprisoned by, by the government, there's a few steps that the OHCHR can take up to and including um, kind of getting them out the country if necessary. But earlier steps would be bilateral conversations with governments, bilateral conversations with embassies who can then kind of offer more protection, maybe bits of funding. It really depends as well country to country, which is something that can be quite tricky because it means that there isn't a sort of blanket um, policy and blanket set of actions that the OHCHR does to protect. It can be a bit patchy. And this is something that I know they're trying to address from, from this end. So if, if you are in touch with your OHCHR office and have recommendations to, to make on how they can improve this, then that would, be, that would be great. And I think they would appreciate that. Um, examples of how to engage treaty bodies like CEDAW. I think for me, the most useful thing to do there is shadow reports, like as I was talking about. And I think, because um, you have the report by the government and often that tells that paints the government in a kind of brighter light than, than it necessarily is. And I think the existence of very sort of factual evidence-based shadow reports from NGOs, they go down very well with the CEDAW committee. They can be very, very powerful. And also it really helps to kind of counter government's narrative because we see this a lot with CEDAW in particular. The governments really play up very kind of minor things they're doing to improve women's rights while kind of ignoring the vast structural kind of discrimination and problems that that women face and that minorities face. Um, and so shadow reports can be a very good way of sort of countering that, that kind of overly positive um, narrative. Um, or I'm just gonna take this street protest as well, one at the uh, two, because we've been dealing a lot with and, uh, protests here. Actually at this uh, upcoming Human Rights Council session, there'll be a resolution on peaceful protests, which we'll be working on quite a lot. Um, I think protests are absolutely an advocacy strategy. I think especially in countries that are more close to civic space, protest can often be the, literally the only way of exercising your democratic right for your voice to be heard. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, protest for me, absolutely an advocacy strategy, very pro peaceful protest. Um, I think they should be protected better, which is what we're going to be working on next week. We'll see how that goes, but, but yeah. Okay. Cool for me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. I want to direct the other questions to um, my senior colleague, Paul and, and Osai. I hope they are here. Paul, are you back? Uh, so the question says, abusive leaders get protections from the West. I don't want to put Lisa on the spot since she's, she's in the West right now. So I want to ask Paul, 
uh, why, how, how can we stop that? Abusive leaders get protections from the West, especially where violations of human rights are concerned. And, uh, and maybe for Osai to also get prepared, how can we uh, uh, ensure protection for human rights advocate at the UN? So, uh, yeah, Paul, thanks for the floor now. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry I missed. Uh, I'm sorry I missed um, um, most of the the questions, questions and answers. I was I could not uh, join in. I had to log out and log in. Yes. On the question of uh, uh, some governments being protected by Western world. Uh, in terms of human rights abuses. We have to understand that uh, the international relations um, govern the bilateral interactions of these states. Um, and when we are talking of uh, human rights uh, promotion and protection, it's not between the state and the state. We are looking at the mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So um, there could be, uh, obviously there, there will always be different um, interests between one state and the other. So that one, uh, we cannot do much about it. And, uh, practically and principally, we can't do much about it. But when it comes to um, human rights systems, we have to look at the, what are the rubrics, for instance, within the UN system, within African, um, Africa, Africa Union or African human rights system. Uh, we follow principles um, that guide uh, those uh, conventions, uh, those declarations, um, uh, not looking at the um, bilateral interests. So you will find, let's say, uh, I don't want to name countries here, but one state is favoring the other based on their bilateral interest. It is wrong. It will be wrong. And you will always find those um, syndicate or uh, proxy um, um, relations at the UN. That's where lobbying comes in. That's mm -hmm. where advocacy comes in. How do you lobby country X to support your idea? Mm -hmm. uh, it is like between me and you, principally as individuals, who will have uh, relations that may not attract or may not um, uh, support the idea of the other person. So on that, I don't think we may have a lot to do uh, mm -hmm. looking at the international relations. Um, international politics and bilateral relations based on the interest of the countries. But what we need to do is to engage, is to advance our lobbying, is to advance our advocacy, even where countries, uh, if I can give an example, um, not to take long. Uh, for instance, e, uh, the, when the LGBTI um, law had been passed in Uganda, um, the criminalizing everything around the issues. So yeah. what we did was to engage with those governments that really looked supporting the regime that supported Uganda in other aspects. Mm -hmm. For instance, like America, we had to intensify the, um, the government of America. We had to intensify our, uh, intensify our lobbying. The, um, how do you call it? The, um, uh, the Netherlands, uh, the Finland, the, 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 Nordic, the Nordic countries, we had to intensify our engagements with them. And you know what happened? Mm. In their international relations, in their bilateral relations, they sat and said, you see, if we go ahead with all our promises, the development promises, there is no way how we are going to convince our parliaments that we are giving you money for the roads, we are giving you money for electricity, but you have come up with zero that put, uh, puts people, I, I mean, uh, death penalty. So yeah. then they said, we are going to cut our budgets 25%. Each country said that. Obama's uh, government said, hold on, we should uh, reduce PEPFA, which everything around HIV AIDS uh, budgeting comes from America. And the government, the president in his speech said, this is no longer a war against LGBTI. It is a war against Uganda. He dropped the what? He dropped the law. And up to now, we don't have any law uh, criminalizing uh, such things. So bilateral relations, they will always be there. Interests yes. will always be there. Our role, as um, Lisa said, as uh, Omarara said, is to engage, to intensify our advocacy and our lobby.
All right. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, Osai. Osai. Yes. Protection for human rights advocates. Hmm. <laughs> so, uh, it's, it's very interesting they bring that notion because where, where I sit as Amnesty International, oftentimes they accuse us of pushing a, West Africa, a Western agenda mm -hmm. for fighting human rights in the country. So I think it just depends on where you sit and who's ox being gold. Uh, very often we need to understand that uh, foreign powers also have their priorities and their interests and everybody is very much interested in uh, a system that works orderly, rights are respected, some more than others. But at the same time, because we are dealing with independent countries, you cannot have a situation where another country can force or interfere, or unduly interfere in another country's affairs. So that is why diplomacy is key in many of the interactions that the West and even in Africa have with other African countries to ensure that they're complying with the international laws and international standards. It might look like they're delaying, it might look like somebody is supporting the other, it might look like there's a lot of economic interest at play, but believe me, there's a lot of negotiations and these negotiations are complex, they can take a lot of time, and the situation needs to be right. You see, you, you can see sometimes now with what is going on with the pushback from the US with protests. A lot of people are confused by that because a few years back, the US used to be the, like the police of the world, telling everybody you're doing wrong, everybody's always looking forward to the reports of the US. But now we're seeing that with the, the, law, the world order is now, that role is not being played by the US so visibly. But that does not mean that when they get into the UN or when they are having conversations, the U.S. still does not raise those issues about human rights situation in Africa. They do. It's just that the way at which the government might be persuaded to act would differ. So let me give an example of some of the work Amnesty has done in Nigeria. One of the reasons why the government in Nigeria set up a panel to investigate allegations of violations committed by the military in the fight against Boko Haram was because Amnesty and a group of other organizations petitioned the UN treaty bodies, petitioned the ICC, wrote to specific states like the US, the UK, Germany, and other states based on what their based on what national law says. So like in the US, for example, their law says they cannot sell weapons to countries where there's a likelihood that they are going to commit human rights violations. So Amnesty reminded them of that particular provision in their own law. So in order for them to be able to sell weapons to Nigeria, they wanted Nigeria to make sure that it has put in place mechanisms, strategies that will prevent the weapons they are going to sell to them to be used to commit human rights abuses. Yeah, so it delayed the purchase of those weapons for a couple of years before they were allowed to do so. And many Western countries also offer safe havens for human rights defenders whenever the situation arises. But ultimately, we are all seeing it now. COVID has shown this to us. We're all connected. We're all struggling. It's going to be very hard now for human rights defenders to be flown into different countries in order to keep them safe. We need to find ways through which we can work with our governments to do the right thing. Because even if they want to receive you now, there's no flight that can take anywhere outside of where you are at the moment. So these are some of the realities that we work with. All right. Thank you so much, Osai. Thanks a lot. And, and I think I agree with, with, with your point around uh, safe ev heavens for, for human rights um, uh, act activists. Uh, I've, I've seen a lot of that happen across the, the, the continent. Um, so the question on is passing a popular message and advocacy strategy or something. Yes, uh, when you are, when you are passing a popular message, for example, uh, I'm sure we are all familiar with I Can't Breathe Now. Uh, one thing about crafting an advocacy message is putting in mind that uh, 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 you cannot, or it will be a disservice for you to craft an ambiguous message. Your message has to be crisp and direct, such that everybody can relate to it. 
when you say I can I can't breathe now, everybody knows what you're talking about. You're talking about police brutality uh, against black or anywhere you say it. It means there's a form of brutality or an attack on you. It's now becoming a global way of expression. Just recently, I was uh, we had a few you know ecops here in Ghana, and somebody wore a, a shirt that says Nigerians can breathe, and I just laugh like, oh, come on, we can breathe, you know. So I mean, yeah, when is the popular message? It's a, it's a form of advocacy tactics, which has a lot to do under education. You remember when I, I recounted um, the different uh, strategy family that we have. Uh, a street protest, uh, uh, an advocacy or something. Yes, street protests sit comfortably under confrontational strategy. Anything that takes you to the streets, uh, uh, mobilization, hunger strike, protests, placard carrying, you know, and all those things. It's pretty, pretty uh, 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 confrontation. It means we have not been able to engage uh, on a round table. We can discuss on a round table. We have left the court front and all of that. But one thing that is important is that for every advocacy you do, or as an advocate, it is advisable that you have a mixed bag of strategy. You can't use just one. So there are times you have a, a, a crop of your colleagues having a round table conversation, and then you have some on the streets, you know, using different types of strategies at the same time, just so we could get whatever we desire. So yeah, it, it it happens, but indeed, it is um, strict protest in itself sits comfortably within the confrontational strat uh, uh, strategy. Um, so do we have other questions? Lisa, before you run, I know you have to leave us very soon, and I think you'll be best for this question. Somebody says that um, the right to vote, it's a universal right all around the world, at least from the age of 18, I guess that, that, that's the age. Uh, so how come uh, the U.S. employs a system called Electoral College. Isn't that a violation of people's mandates? So Lisa, please come back. You need to answer this question. And I, I'm asking this question with the asker, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Why do we have Electoral College? I mean, we have millions of people who have exercised their, their, their civic right, and then a college would decide. What does that mean? That's that's a violation of my of my civic decision or mandate. Yeah, I mean, I do, I don't disagree. I think the electoral college is is a very strange and outdated form of of choosing a head of state. And um, I know a lot of civil rights uh, groups in the U.S. are trying to change that. Which which we'll see. Like ultimately, it's down to how the U.S. Constitution is is built, and obviously that doesn't exactly. change overnight um and there's nothing specifically in international law international human rights law which says how votes need to be kind of counted or grouped or or dealt with just that people have a right to vote which in the u.s kind of arguably is often they don't but the electoral college doesn't nest doesn't fall kind of foul of international law but there are groups in the in the u.s trying to make it more equitable and so um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all, all the all power to them. I, I hope they manage it. I think the electoral college is, college is very outdated. But in the UK as well, where I'm from, we have a first past the post system, which also is is not not good. Um, I'm not sure if, if there exists anywhere like the perfect electoral system. I know the US definitely is not it. I know the UK is definitely not it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think I this is something that we're going to have to work on in the future for sure. I completely agree with you, and I'm aware that there are certain rights groups who have been, you know, constantly talking about the need to 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 put aside the electoral college and a system within the uh, U.S. electoral system or parameters, as it were. Uh, we're hoping that um, we'll make a leeway, you know, as soon as possible. But like you rightly said, uh, I think as, across country, we are all trying to perfect our electoral systems. And uh, even here in Ghana, Nigeria, Togo, and, 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 and across other countries, as South African and Uganda as well, we have issues that 
we, 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 we want to resolve. And I think they all uh, sit within our desire to deepen, you know, our democracy in our respective countries. And we have, you know, better world uh, uh, for ourselves and, and, and our people. So yes, it's, it's, it's an unfinished business. Uh, like, I, like I do tell people in each of my section, there is no time as an advocate that you can beat your chest that we are finished. We'll finish advocacy. You cannot finish advocacy. What you have exactly. done, the only thing you can finish is that, you know, I'm tired of reviewing the situation again because it's like, it's a vicious, a, a vicious cycle. The, if you reflect on it again, you're going to see another gap and then you're going to start all over again. There is no country that has reached that state of utopia. You know, we are all perfect. Everything is as we want it. Now, the world is evolving and it will forever evolve. So you cannot finish advocacy. That is to say, as an advocate, you cannot have rest. I'm sorry, but it's, it's a fact. So um, I think let's open the floor now. If you have a question, uh, to, to Lisa, I think I want you to go first. If you are directing your questions or comment to Lisa, because Lisa will be leaving us in another 10, 15 minutes. So please, uh, we have the floor now. Just raise your hand. I think we can raise hands, right? Yes, there's Seidu and Dennis who have their hands up. But before that, there's a question in the chat from Vanilza. And okay. she said, how can we contribute as communication professional so that there are no situation of persecution and kidnapping of people, especially in this time of COVID-19, and that we are seen with advisors from the government? Oh, okay, how can we contribute as communication professional, right? Yes. yes, to avoid situation of persecution and kidnapping from government. Well, I think if, if I may just try my hands on that, I think as communicationists, as, as, as we call them, it's about you saying something and saying it, putting the information there. And I, I believe you guys, you have certain strategies and skills that you use in packaging uh, your findings or issues around you uh, in a very strategic way to get attention of our policymakers, to educate the populace, to ginger the, the, the populace into, you know, working or joining you on the issues. So I think, yes, uh, your contribution will be in how you have communicated. Increasingly, uh, there's been a lot of attack on on, uh, on social media. I call social media the best form of uh, democratization of voices. Our voices has never been this democratized since I was born. Now people can sit in their kitchen and have a voice and say something. But of course, we are increasingly seeing governments coming up with, with different uh, you know, obnoxious comments, as I put it, trying to discredit social media. This is not to say that we don't have some uh, 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 elements within us who are using this platform to share fake news or to even instigate uh, some form of, of violence. So as a communication person, it will be for you to be able to verify the information you have and you're able to put the fact out there and put it in a strategic manner and be clear on who you are targeting it to. I think it's really going to be helpful uh, if you could do that for us. I mean, you brand yourself uh, consistently in a way that people know whatever they read from you must be genuine. You know, uh, when, when we want to validate some things, it's a shame on, on the continent today, when we want to validate what has been said or put out there, we go to BBC and, and uh, we go to CNN or we go to Al Jazeera. I'm looking forward to a time where the continent would have its own media powerhouse. And, you know, across countries, we, we have been able to establish something like that. For example, if you're Nigerian, uh, you will most likely want to believe what you're hearing on channels because of the way they have packaged themselves over the year. But uh, continent-wide, I'm looking at for a time where we would have uh, an Al Jazeera that is going to be African. So when we're talking about African news, you know when you get it here, it is not only authentic, it has been validated and is the truth, rather than having to, to, to visit or patronize the Western, Western media, who, of course, we know as, as uh, one president will say, you know. <laughs> okay, so um, yes, I think, I don't know whether our colleagues have something to say to that. How can communication experts help 
to contribute to, to this, this fight. Paul, do you have something to say or I should just go ahead and open the floor? Yeah, please. Um, yeah, the, for me, the, maybe the best is uh, to, to have, um, how do you call it, human security. Because mm -hmm. if I understood the question um, is to, uh, in order to avoid um, abductions and uh, you know, something mm -hmm. like confiscation, something like that, to have human security as uh, activists, mm -hmm. as human rights defenders, as advocates, we need to know the context. Um, don't, because uh, Omarara had given you uh, skills of advocacy and is going to give you a certificate, then you go around saying, I am now an advocate so I can speak my mind. Human rights are universal. I, I, I understand the context. Yes, we want you to go and engage, but remember the way you engage either the, the repercussions of engagements may uh, scare others because, for instance, if you are abducted and you, you disappear, you may scare others not to fall into to um, your footsteps or um, you may be killed and that's all. We've lost you. So the human security part of it, how do you secure yourself? Understand the context. What is it that the government likes to hear and does not want to hear? And then how do I package it? Mm. Don't leave it because it is controversial. No, bring it. But how do you package it? Are you trying to target an individual or you are targeting the government? So if you try to target an individual in the government, that's when the, the problem comes. That individual will fight back. Target the situation, target the institution, target the issues. The, but, uh, here I cannot give a concrete answer, but just to give a general um, um, situation, a general answer sort of, that we need to understand the context. We need to um, engage uh, within the space that is available, not being uh, confrontational um, and also but putting our human security uh, into perspectives. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Paul. And apologies, I missed the, the part on, on abduction. Yes, I completely agree with, with, with what Paul has said. Uh, one thing that is important to us as advocates, uh, uh, not only human rights, I mean, advocates generally, is uh, uh, for us to be able to analyze our context. Now, I do tell people, you cannot copy and paste advocacy. What they did in the Gambia, we are going to do the same thing in Togo. It's not going to work. Your context is important. Having a deep knowledge of your context, having a deeper knowledge of your actors and institution, even having good knowledge of your laws, what to do and not to do, and bringing all of this to the table before you even make choice of your strategies, they are important. Now, what we don't do is, as advocate, we get already excited. I mean, they did this thing in um, the Arab Spring. So, you know, we are also going to do the same thing and all of that. It doesn't work that way. You cannot copy and paste or some of these strategies because you have to contextualize it. You know, it's, it's, it's important. Now, uh, a number of points I didn't also touch on is the risk that is, you know, attached to our crypto advocacy. There are a lot of risk to this. And that is why, depending on the risky nature of your, of your context, you, there are a number of things, I, we don't have time, there are a number of things you need to consider even before you settle for certain kind of strategies. It's important. And it, it, that's why, like I said, analyzing, you cannot overanalyze. There's no time you would say, oh, you know, we have analyzed this thing too much. Analysis and analysis of everything, of your actors, of your context, of your law, of your facts, figures, and evidences, they are all critical components of uh, a successful advocacy. Whether you're going to be successful or you're going to fail, uh, it's, it's, it's important. So, I mean, we'll have to... Yeah. Yes. Yes, uh, there is a question, I think, leading to that in the chat. Uh, someone saying, um, if the implementers who are supposed to respond to the issues are doing nothing about the subject, what can you do as an individual or organization um, uh, just to uh, put a rejoinder on what I had uh, earlier said, 
in most cases, policymakers will ignore you if your advocacy is not focused, if you make it general, okay, without any, I mean, the issue is not focused. Uh, like what Omarara said, if you are looking at the women's rights, okay, women's rights are many. Which exactly are you talking about? Gender issues. What exactly are you talking about? If you are going to the parliament, are you focusing at a specific uh, parliamentary committee or you are just going to the parliament? Let's say we talk about uh, Nigerian parliament, which has over uh, 500 people. Who is going to respond to you? Is it the speaker? Is it, you know, so you need to focus. But more so, this is where lobbying comes in. If the policymakers are, um, are keeping quiet or are ignoring you, select or identify. There is what we call in other words, what we call mapping your stakeholders. Map your stakeholders. See the soft spot. Where can you start from? Start with one person. Start with two, so that at least you have um, someone you are talking to, someone you are engaging with on the issue who can introduce you to others. But if we um, brand our advocacy general without being focused on institutions, remember what I said, focus on the institution. And even within the institution, go deeper, focus on the individual who is going to, you know, to help you on doing this. Uh, and and it can, the, most of the challenges, almost of the times we have this challenge of, I want my advocacy today, I want to see things done tomorrow. No. Take your time. Today is ignoring you. Continue. Tomorrow is ignoring you. Continue. After a week, nagging. For you, it may be a nagging message, a nagging e email or a brief. But for him, it is a reminder. This person, at the end of the day, he may say, but why is he doing this? Okay, come and we talk. You get it. So it is a gradual um, process. And uh, um, that's why it is called strategic. I mean, the strategy, uh, your advocacy strategy, what is it? It's not a one-off. Uh, one needs to continue uh, engaging. Sorry, yes. time is never enough for some of these questions. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Paul. And uh, maybe just to add that uh, ignoring you is actually a potent strategy that most governments will use. So you need to prepare your mind that maybe throughout exactly. this year, they are going to ignore you. So yes, if you exactly. have factored that into your own planning, you won't feel any bad. So I, I know they are going to ignore me for a while, but you own it to yourself. Like I said, yes. in your analysis and the willingness to repeat what you have said last year, to repeat it again and again and again. So yes, they will ignore you. In fact, if they don't ignore you, then you may be a target they will re ignore you because it's also a, a, an opportunity for them to weigh the importance of what you're saying, whether you mean it or you have just seized an opportunity. Uh, maybe you were part of a team that have gone to the parliament and you saw the opportunity to raise the issue and that's it. Maybe it's not something that you are conscious or you are deliberate and intentional about. But by the time they see the way you are unleashing each of your strategies and whatever, then they know that, okay, this guy missed something. So do not be deterred when you are ignored. It is a strategy. If I was in government, I will ignore you to say, yes. oh, you know, a bunch of noise maker. You have to convince me that your noise is not ordinary noise. You meant it. So if I switch position today from being an activist and I become um, president of Nigeria, I'm going to ignore you. Okay, because like we, like, and one of the points that we share is that an average policymaker is under pressure. You are coming up with LGBTI issue. He, he, and this another person is coming up with, uh, uh, you know, uh, girl child education. Another person is coming up with climate change. Sometimes we need to reason in the shoes of policymakers. If you don't know them, your efforts may be in futility. You need to understand. And now it is who they see today, tomorrow, next, tomorrow to them who means business. So if you are not consistent in your engagement, it means that issue is not so keen to your heart. You get what I mean? Many people, many advocates are engaging the same parliament 
all the time. They are engaging finance minister. They are engaging foreign minister on diverse issues representing diverse constituency within civil society. What makes you different? Why do you deserve my, my, my attention? Yeah, that's it. It's that simple. So you determine whether you're going to get listened to or not. So you will be ignored. That's all I'm trying to say. Definitely you will be ignored and it should be part of your planning. When I'm ignored, what do I do to get an attention? And like we say, it's, it's not a one-off event. Every step you go all the way should be acknowledged and celebrated. If you get attention today, you have crossed one or two and you are closer to your advocacy success. It's not until, yes, CEDAW is now implemented in Nigeria that you can celebrate. There are so many things that goes into the process of advocacy. Like we said, it's a set of actions. People have been fighting for 30% women's representation in the parliament before I left primary school. And they are still doing it today. So it's, it's something that we hand over from generation to generation to generation. You see? It's, 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 it's not even in our, you'll be surprised that when you go to South Africa, when you go to Senegal, and uh, which other country has a very high representation of Rwanda, of women, they are still making demands. Okay, so you will be ignored. You just need to keep reflecting on your strategies and successes made and then make changes as required. Um, I think Lisa is leaving us now. Um, I want to open the floor. Uh, okay, somebody says, Peel, Peel says, in advocacy, is it necessary to give away certain demand in achieving your goal? As an advocate, should I build an alliance with members of parliament who share the same concern for the passage? Um, okay, I lost that. For the passage... For the passage of law addressing the issue. Now, this is an important one. Um, so there are so many skills you have to pick up as an advocate. We call something negotiation skills. Before you engage or at the point of engaging, you need to know your trade, your trade offs and your non trade off. If you don't have it, it's like bargaining in the market. You know what you want to buy and you know how much you want to buy it. Of course, there's going to be negotiation. Uh, God help you if you are negotiating in the Nigerian market. You may not survive. <laughs> if you get what I mean? I mean, uh, in general market. But the point is, as an advocate, all your ask may not be given because you are not the only one making demand. And you have to have that in your strategy. For example, say you're making demands for implementation of um, whatever it is, and you, the demand is directly to the um, uh, Ministry of Finance. Many people want to tap into the pool of funding with the Ministry of Finance, okay? Yeah, you are making demands that say uh, you're demanding for education, education budgets to be increased from 5% to 10%. So many people are making different demands. What is your trade off? What would you not take? When I want to negotiate with people, I mean, we don't waste time saying, so I'll pay you $10, I'll pay you $20. Just tell me what you won't take. When you tell me what you won't take, then you are letting me know your trade off and you're not you're negotiable or non-negotiable. Really, that's what we call it when you're talking about. Negotiation is a real, uh, a different conversation in itself that we can talk about for two days, two full days physically, okay? So yes, definitely uh, you should have your giveaways and those are the things you start negotiating with. Okay, if we cannot get this, uh, we are willing to give this away, but government should be able to do this. And then you go gradually until you get to the rock where you can no longer trade us, okay? So you start your negotiation with things that you can do away with. We can talk a lot about that skills. Um, yes, building uh, uh, alliances with people who or, or whose interest resonates or is in alignment with yours is a plus to your issue. Again, don't forget, we said advocacy is simply about the more the merrier. The more people talking about it, the more pressure you give to government. Initially, I tell people, so if we are talking about education rights or rights to education or whatever, make sure the people within your network or coalition, they are not all educationists. Be able, and depending on how you analyze your issue, you would see that parents, for example, would have a role to play. They would see themselves, convince people, present your case in a way that people who are not primarily working on your issue can see themselves in it. 
So when you move and government can see that, okay, these are not all teachers. We even have nurses. What has nurses got to do with education? So for example, if you are talking about girls education and you leave the, 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 the advocacy to only uh, teachers and all of that. The nurses can come from an angle that, you know what, we have a lot of trouble trying to deliver students who are pregnant because they bring some sort of complication. So if they are well educated, then we won't have these issues at the clinics. So you must, when you do your thorough stakeholder analysis, you must be able to identify how that issues connect with different crops of stakeholders. Okay, and when you're able to do, including the parliament, when you're able to do that, what you're doing is strengthening your case and your building is a better foundation for your advocacy. So it's, it's, it's important that you, you, you form this kind of alliances. It's highly recommended. Um, okay, that's fine. I want to hear people's voices now. I want to hear your voices. So we still have like... Um, 30, 40 minutes. I think I really love the way we went today. The presentations were short and then we have enough room for conversation. So um, I can't see and Shamrid, I don't know what is happening. Where am I supposed yes. to see? The, on the participant side, you see there's Seidu and Dennis Hans, which was up. Seidu was up first. Seidu. Okay, yes. so Seidu, please unmute your mic. Okay, I can see it now. Don't mind. I mean, we are all learning this thing. So Seidu, you have the floor now. Seidu, you have the floor. Oui. Hello? Hello? Yes. Yeah, please go on. Hello, bonjour. Alors, je voudrais réagir un peu par rapport à, aux, aux outils de, de plaidoyer et de... De, de lobby pour dire effectivement comme euh, la présentation a montré il y a beaucoup de d'informations et de clarifications sur des concepts et des, des stratégies qui sont utilisées pour faire le lobby et le en fait le lobby et le plaidoyer qui en fait dans notre contexte nous en tant que francophones disons n'a pas de n'a pas de frontières mais j'ai bien aimé la conclusion le lobby est un outil est une partie du plaidoyer. Par contre, le plaidoyer aussi intègre en réalité le lobby. Je voudrais aussi partager avec vous l'expérience des mouvements populaires, des mouvements de rue qui en réalité peuvent être à la fois des outils qu'on utilise lors de la confrontation, mais dans le plaidoyer aussi, on peut utiliser les manifestations de rue. Il s'agit maintenant de l'approche qu'on utilise pour faire des, des manifestations de rue. Mais les manifestations de rue, les sittings et les autres actions de rue, en fait, semblent être des éléments de confrontation, mais ils peuvent aussi être utilisés au moment, dans, dans le cadre d'un plaidoyer ou d'une éducation populaire. Par contre, je reviens aussi sur la question de euh, la déclaration et la, les conventions, déclarations et les chartes. Je veux revenir un peu sur euh, le PIDESC, le protocole international sur les droits économiques, sociaux, culturels, qui malheureusement, malheureusement sont laissés un peu en rade par beaucoup de défenseurs des droits humains. Or, si nous sommes d'accord que les droits humains sont indivisibles et sont non hiérarchisés, je pense qu'il est important que l'on fasse l'effort de travailler davantage sur les droits économiques, sociaux, culturels, qui peuvent aussi être des instruments pour permettre aux droits civils et politiques de se réaliser. Parce que ventre affamé n'a point d'oreille. Je veux parler du droit à l'alimentation qui, en réalité, souffre dans le cadre d'outils et d'instruments de mise en œuvre. Il y a des rapporteurs spéciaux pour les Nations Unies, il y a eu les directives de la, de volontaires de la FAO, mais malheureusement, jusqu'à aujourd'hui, les États encore réchignent à mettre en œuvre le droit à l'alimentation. Est-ce que c'est par méconnaissance Est-ce que c'est parce qu'il n'y a personne derrière qui oblige le gouvernement à remplir, à réaliser, à mettre en œuvre ses obligations C'est un point d'interrogation. Je pense qu'à ce niveau-là, il y a un effort de faire une jonction entre toutes les formes d'organisation, que ce soit des, des organisations de défense des droits humains ou des organisations carrément qui sont du développement pour créer une masse critique d'acteurs susceptibles de défendre et de revendiquer les droits économiques, sociaux, culturels. 
Voilà peut-être la, la, la contribution que je voulais faire. Merci beaucoup. All right. Thank you so much, Saeed. Those are important, important contribution, uh, contributions. Uh, and I completely agree with you. Uh, okay. I completely agree with you that um, uh, I think uh, having worked in the region for about 12, 12, 13 years now, I have personally noticed a sharp contrast between Anglophone and Francophone context. I've had opportunities to, to engage with uh, civil society actors within this uh, uh, two contexts. And uh, I, I agree with you, the context are pretty, pretty different. It's, I mean, I mean uh, you may think Ghana is so close to Togo, uh, almost without borders, but when you're talking about the political space, you're talking about the policy space, uh, it's different and the differences also determine how civil society will engage. So I completely agree with you on that, on that point. And um, also uh, the question around street protest. Yes, we did agree that street protest is a form of tactics on the uh, confrontational. Um, what we are however trying to say is um, um, as we talk about uh, deepening uh, uh, democracy in our respective countries and the fact that we have refused to, to leave democratic uh, uh, and governance issues to our government, we refuse to do that. We have to be part and parcel of the process. And in order to do that, we want to engage uh, 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 using different, different strategies. We want our governance to be inclusive, to be participatory and all of that. So what we are saying is, can we ensure that we have used every other noon strategy before we confront, because we, we are willing to work together with government. I mean, this is for our sustainable development as a country or as a people. And this is our people that, I mean, the government are not imported from another country. They are, they are citizens of Ghana or citizens of whichever country we are talking about. So what we are saying is, yes, street protest is potent, and it's important that we use it. But before we do so, because in most cases, street protests uh, 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 um, posit that uh, communication has broken down, so if I may put it that way. You know, so they are, is either we have spoken many times, they are not listening to us, or they are listening to us, or they've listened to us, but they did, did not take any action. So we want to speak louder in a, whatever way that is available to us, okay? So what we're saying is, can we ensure that we have documented proof of how we have engaged using other strategies and also document the failures of those strategies before we tell ourselves, you know what, we have no other means but to really go on the street, if you get what I mean. So I agree with you. And of course, I mean, with the increase in social movement now, which uh, 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 the evidences are there, they, they actually give us a lot of quick wins. When we're talking about social movement, social movement gives us a lot of quick wins than when you're talking about uh, organized and planned strategies or advocacy. Uh, we can't compare the wins from uh, social movements, which are qu usually quick, than uh, to when we have to, you know, meet different groups of people and try to cajole, try to lobby, try to convince and all of that. But for us, uh, it's important that we look at the sustainabilities of those wins which is what advocacy can give us that most times social movements don't. And if you look at countries where social movements have kind of um, elicited one wins or the others, post-social movement, we always have a new conversation on what next, then what do we do? And usually it's something that we're difficult to grapple with. So, you know, I mean, let's give others room to also share their views. This is a conversation that we can go on and on and we can learn from, but thank you for those insights. Uh, Shamri, do we have, a, okay, we have a, a Van, Vanisa. Vanisa, you can unmute yeah. your mic and then you can speak now. You can just tell, introduce yourself and then speak. Hi. 
can we unmute her or something? Okay, you can speak now. Boa tarde a todos. Eu sou Eu sou Vanilza Agostinho da Silva. Sou guineense e também sou membro da Ordem dos Jornalistas da Guiné-Bissau. Mas antes de trabalhar ligada à comunicação, eu fazia parte da da Humanité Inclusão, uma organização que trabalha ligada às pessoas com deficiência, e também trabalhei com a Liga Guineense dos Direitos Humanos. Mas o que me preocupa neste momento, principalmente a situação em que se vive no meu país, é sobre os raptos de pessoas. E temos caso até em que os deputados da nação foram raptados, e um caso concreto que, que eu queria dar exemplo é do, do, da apreensão do deputado Marciano Indi, quando, ela, quando ele era raptado, os populares da localidade de Safim saíram à rua para exigir a libertação do deputado, não só como deputado da nação, mas também como filho daquela localidade que é próximo a Bissau, que é a capital guinense. Portanto, o que eu queria saber, como é que nós aqui devemos fazer para, para que não haja, digamos, confronto, como aconteceu, entre os policiais e populares daquela localidade, mas sim que haja uma intervenção positiva, sendo que nós já não vamos trabalhar pela violência, mas sim para que haja libertação pacífica da pessoa que é raptada e que, haja um, e, e, e que houve descontentamento por parte daquele, de populares daquela localidade. O que é que devemos fazer para que não haja situações do género? Sabendo que nós próprios devemos trabalhar para que haja, uh, digamos, forma de resolver as questões em termos pacíficos e, e ser Sim, eu queria dizer que eh, devemos trabalhar para que não haja situações onde haja violência, mas sim resolução de problemas em termos pacíficos, ou em termos eh, mais suaves, sem, sem que haja perturbações a nível da sociedade. Muito obrigada. All right. Thank you so much. Um... Va Vanisa, thank you. Osai, are you there? I know uh, working for Amnesty International, uh, I'm sure there have been a number of cases like this that may have, you know, passed through your tables. Uh, uh, is Osai there? So I would no, like I to start. She, she left earlier. She, she mentioned in the chat that she had on it. Uh, okay, okay, that's fine. So I'm going to call Paul then before before I respond. Uh, I know Guinea-Bissau is a very special case at the moment. And um, yeah, for a while now, I have been watching from a distance. Paul, how can we, um, the issue of kidnapping, you talked about it earlier. Would you have one or two comments this time again? Um, I have to... Sir, so I did not get the gist of the whole question. Uh, maybe if you, just in two, three words, if you could tell me what okay. she referred to. So there is an increased kidnapping of people, activists as the case uh, uh, may be in, mm -hmm. in, in Guinea-Bissau. And mm -hmm. uh, she's talking about how can we stop that or protect uh, this activist. But she's also talked about the fact that even an M MP, members of parliament have been kidnapped. There is increased uh, demonstration and violence. How can we reduce all of this so that life can go on uh, as expected? Yeah, uh, OK. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, we've, we've been following that um, uh, uh, actually up 
to last year, even some had to escape. Um, I remember I met some uh, activists in uh, Europe uh, toward the end of last year uh, in one of the conferences, um, yeah, having run away from those situations. Yes, um, first of all, within our advocacy, what I would, uh, looking at and uh, sharing my experience, um, we needed to do work together as a group. That's one. Um, don't go as an individual uh, if you are doing this advocacy. Uh, it goes again all to the security, the human security, um, so that if, uh, let, let's say if it is a, a campaign against uh, corruption, um, it should not be like one organization leading it, and in one organization you are, ban Vanilisa, you are the head of that campaign, so you are easily identifiable. If at all, you are also still in the coalition, but you are identifiable, but at least you have three, four, five, ten people who can, within three or four hours, identify uh, Vanilisa is um, abducted, is arrested. They can raise an alarm. That is at the national level. So at least if you are abducted, you are not spending like 24 hours without, um, people don't know where you are. At least there is the information you have been abducted, then they can raise uh, noise here and there. That's one. Uh, secondly, when uh, the noise is raised at the national level, let it go beyond the borders. As I'm talking now, there is someone who was arrested last uh, Wednesday in South Sudan. Mm. They raised their noise. It uh, leaked uh, to the outside borders. We've now written the letters to presidents. We've written the letters to the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders. We've re uh, written letters to African Union. So some of our governments fear name and shame. Yeah. They will do these things as long as they know they are within the borders. But as long as they get out, the, the frequency and the intensity of abductions and the arrests will reduce. So we need to make noise within our borders. We need to get the contacts. Um, for instance, for us as civicists, we are I'm always on standby, for instance, uh, from the, my role, to write a statement of abduction in, within 24 hours. If you come to me and you say, someone has been arrested, did, 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 this, 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 give me information, then we alert. Is it at UN? Is it um, at African Union? Is it the special rapporteur? Is it on a, uh, social media? So that um, information goes there and then the government will always, sometimes for your information, Van Lisa, you will find the government does not know that Van Lisa is arrested. But mm -hmm. just the security, because one individual in the government you are targeting told the security go and arrest that one. So when the, the government, let's say uh, foreign affairs or the president's office gets a, a phone call from UN, what is this we are reading in the papers? Then the, the parliament or the government is, okay, who is this? Who is Vanadiza? Who is arrested? Then it becomes a national concern. Mm -hmm. Let us not keep quiet, but most important so, let us go as a group. It is always to work in a group, work in a coalition. Work, otherwise, it is hard to dismantle a group. But if you are an individual, you will easily be um, kicked out. Uh, one of our strategies we are doing now is create networks at regional level, I mean at country levels, at regional levels, so that we can work together. You have works, it is, it is there. They can raise a statement, um, uh, uh, on their website, they can raise a statement within the, the ECOWAS networks so that you want, it is no longer a Guinea Bissau thing, it is no longer a Vanilliza thing, but it is a regional, it is a continental issue. All right. Thank you so much, Paul. I think it's important. I guess, Paul, you really answered the questions well. Um, this reminds me of one of the strategies that our nationalist leaders used those days. And I remember that of Nigeria very well. During the military regime in Nigeria, I was pretty young. I'm still very young, by the way. You know, um, I remember that there were quite a number of activists who were engaging, sharing information on the radio 
and the military leaders could not dictate where the broadcasting was coming from. There is one they call um, Kudirat Radio, I remember. So I think um, as things, it's a shame that things are going or seems to be going back to those days. Just when we thought we have leaped forward in our democracy, uh, there is a number of retrogression that we are, you know, uh, we are seeing these days, and I think we also have to re-strategize. Um, there, are, we, we in Waxi, we have a number of uh, training programs that look at uh, digital security. You know, as an activist, as a human rights uh, uh, personnel, there are ways in which you can engage. That where you are broadcasting from or where you are writing from cannot be detected, and all of that. I'm not a techie person, but of course, there are ways in which we are doing that for protections, especially during a lockdown like this, where uh, you may not be able to take cover uh, in another countries and all of that. I think this is important. And, and like Paul said, um, working together is more of a, a, a more of protection for you than you trying to go alone no matter how big how huge how visible how rich your organization is you cannot compare it with having to work with other organizations in a network in a coalition or in an alliance is very important now this is not for you but for the issue the more people, the more organizations that are pushing for the issue kind of gives you protection so that they don't see it as a poor issue. It is not poor that is doing it or <clears throat> one organization that is doing it. So working together, it's, it's, it's a huge plus to such an advocacy, um, to, any, to any advocacy. Um, the next and I have here is from... Uh, <coughs> Dennis, Dennis, please, you have the floor, and let's be let's be fast about it so that we can take more. We are coming to the ends of the conversation gradually. Dennis, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. And let me say, I'm happy again to be on this platform. But uh, one thing I want to understand, like uh, Lisa said, the issue of electoral college. Is something that is being established in a system of the U.S. Mm -hmm. democracy. Then, if electoral college is to the U.S., mm -hmm. then I want to understand what is to Africa and the rest of the continent. What am I saying is because many at times countries will go to election at the end of the day. If someone become Victoria then the U.S. will sit back and condemn the election, how this process was not transparent, was illegal, and a whole lot of stuff. So I don't know what is going on. I already, I'm already confused. Because you are one way of the other infringing on the right of other citizens. Because I don't know if it is because of political will or what. Two. Okay. All right, thank you. Let's let's take Adama so that we can respond to the two together. Thank you, Dennis. You can off your mic now. Adama, you. I see your hand. Adama, please go on. Yes, my hands, my two hands are. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Omolara. I have two questions, and they may appear a bit as uh, comments. The first one I wanted to take us back to the discussion about the when we're doing advocacy. <laughs> the authority looking at us as bringing foreign agenda or Western agenda. So my question is, is it because the language we use during this advocacy making us as having foreign agenda? I remember I was part of this delegation and we met with the president of Mali government and he said, he said something which was which can surprise one. He said, "Why are you bringing?" And the, the advocacy was about the SDGs, how we could buy in the parliament to work on that agenda. And his reply was, "You are bringing foreign agenda." So the question again is: Is it for one of the reasons we are having this feedback? Would it be that we are having the language that does not suit to our local context? I know you big, uh, English speakers, you have big and sophisticated words. But the second point is 
the timing. And I know that you talked about a lot about how we should be knowledgeable of the context and also document what we are advocating for. But sometimes, don't you think we use the wrong timing in the advocacy? For example, you are requesting a change that requires a budget change. You cannot do that at the middle or after the budget process of the country. So don't you think we should also look in or look at the timing when we do the advocacy? Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, Adama. Paul, should I go first or would you go? You're muted. Ladies first. <laughs> Ladies first when it's convenient, right? Oh, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> All right. um, thank you so much. Uh, to the first speaker, you talked about uh, election process, electoral law, electoral college, what is Africa doing and all of that. Hmm. This is interesting. First, let me, let, me, let me share with you that we're going to be, having a, we're going to be having a whole webinar. We're going to be having a whole webinar on uh, elections in West Africa uh, next month is uh, uh, July 17, if I'm correct, July 17 next month. So we'll send all of you the invitation to join this webinar. This is where we'll be dissecting uh, the electoral processes, the uh, electoral monitoring bodies that we have, uh, and all other things you want to know or you want to talk about, especially in West Africa. It may interest all of us to know that uh, about six countries are uh, bid to hold elections in West Africa this year. We have a few states holding elections uh, in Nigeria. Ghana's election is around November, December. Uh, Guinea, Guinea Conakry, Cote d'Ivoire, Niger, Mali. All these countries are bid to hold elections this year, Burkina Faso as well, to hold elections. So it's a, it's, it's a real conversation. I'm not surprised that it's recurrent in this conversation that we are having. Now, all of these countries have different electoral laws and electoral systems. Some of them were, were imported or not, not imported, were inherited from the colonial uh, uh, powers, uh, if you like. And um, yes, it's, it's important that we, we take a second look at what works for us, even though that has not been working, it's not been working well. Um, it's not been working well. But of course, uh, uh, there are a number of issues that we need to address. There is no uh, one size fit all kind of uh, electoral system for the continent. Uh, as a whole, uh, based on the question that you asked. So it's very specific to countries, and countries are finding the best way to, to engage uh, at, at, that, uh, at that. I don't know if I missed a part, a part of that question. But just to go to Adama, Adama, you talked about um, uh, foreign agenda, you know, and I think it's normal, uh, depending on the issue you're working on, I have had opportunity to work on responsibility to protect. When we brought the issue and we're championing it in, uh, uh, in West Africa specifically, uh, we were met with a lot of pushbacks that it was a, a Western agenda because the, the responsibility to protect norm was talking about in a situation where a country is unable to protect a citizen or is unwilling to protect its citizen, the, uh, its neighbors should come in to protect citizen, a kind of invasion if you look at it. And they said it was a Western agenda and all of that. And recently, uh, as WAXI, we are also working on the Financial Action Tax Force Law uh, a mechanism, which is a global mechanism that came forth in the aftermath of the 9-11, uh, you know, to counter terrorism and, uh, and um, money laundering. Uh, a number of countries have seen it as, you know, it's a Western agenda and all of that. But I completely agree with you, Adama. The way we couch, uh, you know, our messaging, irrespective of the issue we are pushing, could be, uh, you know, harmful to the, to, 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 to the advocacy in itself. So it's important that we, and we tell people, even if you are trying to push for a global agenda or something that you think is good for your country, always contextualize. For example, when the issue of COVID-19 came up and um, WHO and other Western, you know, it started in the West and other Western leaders were talking about social distancing. It took us about 
two two months before Africa realized that you know what we cannot the, the the luxury of social distancing is not what we can do in Africa by our settings we are not like that you know isolation and all those strange words and our government just wrote on this international palaces and started talking about it before they realized that okay uh, this may not work in our country so it is it, it behoves us as civil society actors and advocates to always contextualize our intention. You, because you, the, the fight is for your people, it's for your country. You cannot leave that context out of what you are pushing for. So it is important that you make whatever you are pushing, uh, uh, you know, uh, from an indigenous perspective, if you get what I mean. So I completely agree with you on that. Our language, the mode with which we share our information must always be premised within our context. Otherwise, we will not, there's no way we can exonerate ourselves that we are not pushing uh, a, a Western agenda. And then it's, 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 it becomes even more challenging to be convincing. But if from the onset in our planning, we factor our context, our realities into these issues in crafting our messages in doing our analysis and our engagement, then they will see us as being, you know, part and parcel of what is going on in the country. And I completely agree with you. Like I said uh, during the presentation, we have we don't really have much time to delve it. I mean, you know how we do this thing. You've been in WhatsApp before. Timing is very important. Now, in these countries where uh, they are planning for elections, if you are going to make certain demands now, uh, it's a strategic time to do so because now all the political parties are all looking at one customers, you know, the, uh, the, the electorate. So it's a time for you to make demand, for you to question the unquestionable, for you to engage the unengaged in the past and all of that. And in most cases, they would even be the one coming to you. It's until after elections that they go back into their tinted four wheels drive and siren. But now, most of them are accessible. They come to you and all of that. So timing is important in advocacy. You really, really have to be strategic in your timing. You cannot, like you rightly said, be engaging a budget conversation in the middle of the of the cycle. If you get what I mean, these are things that happens way before. So timing your advocacy rightly. You cannot be making demands for wrong things at the right time or right things at the wrong time. So this uh, and having a good understanding of your context and your policy and political spaces will give you an idea of whether the time is right or the time is uh on right you know for for your demand uh, paul you may want to add something where is paul he has disappeared i'm there <laughs> okay thank you very much i think you will You've uh, um, alluded to most of these things. Um, in, in terms of electoral colleges, I think we have to be a little bit careful, or with um, not careful, but a little bit uh, um, understanding when it comes to some of these things, especially that they are embedded in our laws. Because this is, uh, um, I would be um, uncomfortable if America was doing things outside. Uh, their constitution but this is something that is within their constitution which means yes. people um americans themselves like it all have accepted it or the majority have accepted it i don't think it has ever been challenged in courts although they are civil um uh, civil uh, movements that are challenging it for of course based on uh, international um, law um, and um, uh, international human, uh, human rights law. So that, that, that one, we may need to go a little bit um, uh, slow on it. But where I have a concern is um, where they want to use uh, maybe their uh, context to monitor and be um, the, uh, how do you call it, perfect in terms of electoral systems all over the world. That's where I have the issue, that they want to look at why, is, why did you rig elections in Ghana? Why did you steal elections? Uh, because you defranchised the many people you know, from voting. So I think that's where we have the issues. And um, that one, we can engage at a different um, uh, 
platform uh, to agree or disagree on the way they are doing it. Advocacy language, I agree with Adama. Sometimes for us, civil society organizations, and I keep telling people, never confront the government. You, a government is huge, government is big. You can't fight the government. It will fight you immediately and you will be finished. Mm. We have to work with the government. Our advocacy should be to work with the government. And through working, then we can lobby, we can do our campaigns, the moment you bring the language that is opposing the government, then they will say, aha, uh -huh, that is a Western concept. Okay. Um, in one of the countries, which I will not mention, I told the, the lobbyists, the human rights defenders, you know what? The government will not accept your strategy. Get the ruling party manifesto. Get it for me. What do you want to do with women's rights? We want participation of women things. Is it in the manifesto? Yes. Use the same language as in the manifesto. Yeah. Put it there. They are man when they ask you this, no, no. Your manifesto is yellow. Only ours is not yellow. But the wording are the same. Okay, what do you want to do on the indigenous people's rights? We want uh, their lands restituted, things compensated. Use the, is it in their manifesto? Use what is in their manifesto. But for you, the moment you begin saying, according to the Convention Against Women, ratified this, this, women are supposed to do like this. Ah, why is he bringing the Geneva Convention in, let's say, Mali? Okay, but the language differs from what they put in the manifesto, but the concept is the same. So study the language your government wants to listen to, then work around it. Then on terms of timing, you see, like uh, Omaraga said, uh, uh, five or six governments will be having uh, elections uh, in, in West Africa. For us NGOs, what have we been doing before? Now, is it the time for sure to be building the capacity of NGOs to engage with the government now? Now it is the time to tell the issue, not to build the capacity. Last few weeks, I was talking to some of the sub-grantees. We sometimes give out to sub, uh, grants to uh, uh, human rights defenders to do uh, activities that we want to build the capacity of uh, NGOs to engage with the elections in Malawi. They voted yesterday. Last two weeks, you want to build the capacity of, uh, of citizens? No. Timing. So after elections, let's say Ghana um, um, goes into election in, the, in, in November, the president swears in December or January. From next year to next five years, actually four years, build the capacity build the, the momentum so that now at this time, it is not you, the NGO, the, uh, around the electoral commission, I mean electoral uh, season, it's not the NGO, it is the citizens. Do you know how it will affect the, um, or it will change the situation if a candidate goes into the village somewhere and people in the village themselves tell him, no, corruption is too much in your government. Mm -hmm. He will, even if he undermines that question there and then, but when he goes back, he will listen to the voices of the people. And like we, the, uh, those are usual noises from the civil society organizations. So timing is important. When do we do what for our yeah. advocacy? All right. Uh, thank you so much, Paul. I see another hand as we come towards the end. Isaac, you may probably be our last hand today. Uh, you can drop your comments. Others can, uh, Shamri, please keep checking the chat box. Isaac, you have the floor. Isaac or Isaac, Kabul, <laughs> you have okay. the floor. Okay, merci. Donc, uh, au début, bon, je n'avais pas eu uh, l'occasion au moins de me présenter. Donc, euh, moi, je suis Isaac Kabou. Je suis le, le news manager de réseau Ouest africain pour l'éducation de la paix, euh, le WANEP. Mais je suis basé au niveau de la Guinée-Bissau. Donc, euh, je, peux, je veux, voudrais profiter de cette occasion pour essayer de, de faire un petit commentaire par rapport au processus électoral. C'est vrai que la Guinée-Bissau a eu 
à, à organiser les élections législatives et les élections présidentielles, le premier tour comme euh, le deuxième tour. Mais il se trouve que les organisations de la société civile, comme je le comprends fondamentalement dans le processus électoral, malheureusement, la loi électorale de la guinée ne permet pas de faire une observation comme ceci. Donc, on est obligé. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, 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 it's the network. Um, Isaac, we can't hear you. We guess you're having issues with your internet. Um, can you type your question? Okay, I think it's speaking now. Donc là, c'est le moment au Allô? Alors, vous m'entendez maintenant? Just tell him to be brief, to the point. Yeah. Okay. Non, 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 juste pour dire que bon, c'est le moment opportun pour les organisations de la société civile de mener de faire le plaidoyer afin qu'au au cours des prochaines élections que euh, l'observation domestique soit insérée au niveau de la loi électorale de la guinée bissau de, de la guinée -Bissau. Donc je pense que c'est le moment opportun pour les organisations de la société civile de se mobiliser, faire un plaidoyer afin que l'observation domestique puisse être inscrite au niveau de la loi électorale. C'était juste le petit commentaire que, que, que je voudrais faire. Merci. All right. Uh, thank you, Isaac. I, I think it's important that we all seize the moment to engage in our respective countries. And electoral year is usually one of those best moments where uh, policymakers, duty bearers are more receptive to whatever we are saying. They are more attentive, they are more accessible, they are more receptive, they are more willing, you know, <laughs> as the case may be. We, it shouldn't be the case, but I think this is what we have are to accustom ourselves to in this part of the world. So let's seize the opportunity, let's seize the opportunity. Um, so at this point, I am not seeing any other hands and I'm not sure, Shamri, do we have any hanging question? Um, yes, there's okay. one question from Chinege who is asking, how do we successfully advocate for the rights of women given the case of patriarchy in Africa? Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So we first, think... kill, we first kill all the men. <laughs> <laughs> no, the thing is, when we kill all the men, I don't think we would have achieved our purpose. We want the men to see and agree see. that we need a system that is going to be, you know, leveled and 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 provide equality for all. You know, this is an interesting question. I think uh, one thing that we have been doing, which we have to continue to do, is holding our government accountable to the different uh, instruments and, and treaties and conventions, you know, and the likes that they have um, signed on to. Uh, when you look at the Maputo Protocol, for example, and then we look at the Belgian Platform for Action, and then we look at the uh, CEDO Convention, and then we look at, uh, I mean, there are quite a number of them. And when we look within the countries ourselves, our gender, um, uh, within our constitutions, when we look at ECOWAS Gender Protocol, and then we look at the rights of women in African Union Charter, there are a number of instruments that we can hold this government to account to. And uh, one thing, being a gender activist myself that I've seen, which has really worked in other places, is that we, as civil society, also devised strategies that we can share with our government to adopt. It may interest you that in some countries, we have what we call um, uh, affirmative action, for example, uh, which is really asking the government to create uh, a specific number <coughs> of uh, positions for uh, women to, to compete between and among themselves to feel, you know, you're reserving seats for women to, to feel. Uh, that's what affirmative action is talking about. And quite a number of governments are doing that, those slow and few, but they are doing that. And which is a strategy that people, uh, we have made demand for, and it's now becoming quite formal and, and, and known. Another one I have seen is uh, people engaging the political parties to create what we call save, um, to create uh, opportunities for women to win in their safe zones, if you get what I mean. So each political party have their strongholds, 
so they know whatever happens, even if they import candidates into that zone, the party is going to win, okay? So such places where you are so sure that you will win, why don't you leave that position, that slot for women, you know? So, I mean, there are a number of strategies that we have devised and we need to continue to push for it. So I think um, for me, is for us as civil society and advocates to think of other strategy that we can share with this government. We do agree that governments are busy. They are thinking of a number of things. So we are going to think for you. We're going to share it with you. Yours is just to rubber stamp it and then implement. So I think this is where we can. And we cannot come up with these other strategies, except we know much more about the issues, about the law globally, regionally, and nationally, and then you know, in dissecting those laws, we can get creative and innovative in what we can do to give more chances to women. And of course, we can overflow the issue of empowerment, uh, you know, capacity empowerment, political empowerment, economic empowerment, which has become the, the, the crux of all kind of uh, 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 opportunities for women, uh, women's advancement. So when you're economically empowered, the likelihood that you are going to do better than others is, is, is there. So I think from me, that will be it. Uh, uh, Paul, we are not going to kill you, man, but maybe you have one idea you want to share as we round up this conversation. It's 15 minutes to 1 p.m. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, no, uh, not much um, from what you've said, uh, but um, just to say that uh, we have to look at the underlying factors Oh, sorry, um, we have to look at the underlying factors um, that facilitate uh, that facilitate all these uh, issues, the patriarchal um, issues in our context. As you rightly said, the economic um, uh, part of it is really, really um, for me the major the major factor, the social economic uh, factor. Even when you look in countries, uh, I mean, at countries like the Rwandas of this world. Um, that have gone beyond the um, threshold, the, the Ethiopia's, South Africa is mm -hmm. moving. At the end of the day, the biggest percentage of women remain behind. Look at the pay ratio, uh, man to woman, same education, same experience, qualification, the woman will always be the other side. So um, uh, we need, first of all, to educate our girls. That is the most important thing. We need to educate our girls. We need to edu I mean, and education, I don't mean sitting them down and talk to them. School education, they need to be empowered. But we need to continue engaging women, I mean uh, men, um, especially in our institutions. I know, and especially West Africa, some of your communities have strong traditional institutions where you cannot change these things in a day. Yeah. That is another thing that takes me back to what I have already said. We are sometimes impatient, but if you look behind, you will realize that even in those communities, even in those traditions, there are some things that are changing. The change may be slow, the change may be small, but I don't think it is still as it was in 90s, in 80s and 70s. So what we need to do is to keep on the fire, but to ensure that we address, uh, um, in, in my advocacy, I, there is always something I call backloading and frontloading. Yeah. Then I am in between. So what is the, um, the underlying factor? Education, empowerment. Let us empower the, the women. That is backlo uh, backloading. Then frontloading. What is the cause of this uh, marginalization of women and their children? These patriarchal traditional institutions, then we deal with those ones now. Then um, it will be, uh, it will be a, a history. I'm very optimistic and very sure about that, but we need to keep the fire burning. Thank you very much. Are we finishing now? Yes, we are finishing now. Thank you so okay. much, Paul. Um, so, um, Chinoya, that's, that's, that's it with that question. I think uh, it's a dual struggle for us. Why we try to continue to um, 
uh, attack patriarchy and try to break it down. We have to also create a, a leverage, you know, uh, point to to be creating this opportunity for we for women. So that's fine. Uh, I'm hoping that we're going to have a dedicated webinar where we are going to talk about these issues. Now that the world has gone virtual, I think we can talk for as as many times as possible. It will be interesting to see what it's happening in different countries with regards to gender equality. And trust me, so far it's policy issues. Wax is here to facilitate such a conversation. So on this note, I'm not seeing any hands now, but I can assure you that the conversation can't be over. But for now, we need to take a pause. Uh, I cannot thank all of you enough for being part of this uh, uh, training as we call it but more or less you know sharing and 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 and, and learning you know we're sharing with ourselves um so with this we will come to the end of this second section and last section if there's going to be any other section again we will let you know there are a number of training areas that we are looking we do or uh, we do acknowledge the fact that uh with the incursion of covid there is less and less opportunity for civil society to own their skills to learn and share you know all those work workshops we have planned or we had planned for in the past, they are not coming on. But WAXI is an organization that is, you know, committed to strengthening civil society uh, organizations and actors will from time to time create opportunities like this, you know, to serve as, um, uh, what do we call it, quick, quick learnings, you know, for uh, between ourselves and we particularly appreciate Civicus for working with us on this one. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you, Lisa and Absentia. Uh, for your support in ensuring that we can talk about human rights, international and regional mechanism, and how civil society can engage. Because like I said last week, human rights continue, uh, violations continue to occur, even within this uh, pandemic. People are noting it, they are recording the violations, and we need to devise a, main, a means you know, to continue our engagement. Um, thank you, Osai, in absentia. Uh, Osai uh, spoke with us last week and a little bit today as well. So all the participants, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask my colleagues to project what your certificate looks like so that you know. <laughs> okay. Shamri, you are not a participant. Why have you put... Oh my goodness. <laughs> guys. It's, it's just a dummy. It's good it's, it's good it's not signed. It's not signed. So I, I would no. be worried if it was signed. <laughs> 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 okay, so this is what your certificates look uh, like for, you know, engaging in this uh, um, uh, training, you know, albeit short and all of that with us. This will be shared with you individually with your name, which you have provided tomorrow, uh, uh, by noon tomorrow, by 12 p.m. Accra time, it will be shared with you tomorrow. And the only thing you have to do is to ensure you respond to the survey, the post uh, uh, training survey that will be shared with you now. Colleagues, you can share the link on this chat box and also send to individuals in their respective email. Kindly respond to that survey. Uh, you can be anonymous or whatever, but share your best feelings and, and comments on how this session has gone. We are open that we are going to be coming along your way with more training sections on issues. So there's a question that is asking about what should have been covered or area you would like to learn from so that um, uh, Waxi and Civicos can think about it and see if we can mobilize resources, I mean facilitators who can share knowledge in that area while we all continue to keep safe away from COVID-19. On that note, Paul, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you for everything. To Waxi team and, and the Civicos team in absentia, we say thank you to every one of you. You have made this uh, sections last week and this week, you have made it a resounding success. And to Serge and team, the, our translators, Thank our interpreters, sorry, our interpreters. Thank you for a fantastic job. Today has been so smooth and, you know, stress-free. I'm really, really happy at what we have done today. So on that note, I say final thank you on behalf of Wax's Management and Executive Director, 
Nana Fajino, who is unable to join us today. We hope next time uh, uh, she would she will at least welcome us and and say one or two words uh, whilst we gather here for another rounds of training uh, in the nearest future. So on that note, we say thank you. Keep safe, protect yourself, and um, we hope to see you again. Goodbye from me for now. Bye.